a distorted, bloody face. What's your name? The Run, Crown, Moor, Overlord. Draw your sword again. And please don't stop. I'll remember you. I forgot everything. I'm just a sword for the king. A bloodied young man is transported somewhere in a ray of light, and at the last moment remembers only this. The light disappears, and everything is completely dark. But there is a second chance. Who am I? Clutching his face, muses a young man, who is being stared at in amazement by two girls. You are the third prince of Kyrus. He hears something that seems obvious to others. I've come back to be a prince, he realizes. Kalyan's journey begins. Hell. Yes, if hell exists, then this is it. The hero looks with horror at an ally with three arrows sticking out of his back at once. Blood gushes from his mouth, but the unfortunate man says something with the last of his strength. Your Highness, D. Baron. The hero calls him by his first name, Kiri, and holds him close. The latter, already barely breathing, says that he did everything he could. Baron furiously shouts out that if he can repay anything, it will only be. He frantically calls out to Kiri, asking her to gather her strength, to raise her sword again. He takes the weapon puts it in the dying man's hand, and asks him not to stop. Kiri eventually dies, and his friend grieves over his body. He can't believe that his friend is dead. Then he picks up the sword that the man has dropped from his lifeless hands. Then he lets out another scream, full of incredible pain. Kyrus, a state founded by dragons and humans. It requested a treasure that belonged to Sekrisha, the hero's homeland. The Axis of Time. A war broke out. Cruel, bloody and merciless. Because the request was rejected. In the battle, Baron lost the hand in which he raised the sword he had picked up next to Kiri's corpse. And that was the beginning. The last war of his homeland. A sign appears, Baron of Sekisha, King of Sekisha. There's only one left. For the glory of Kyrus. Someone shouts. This is clearly some kind of spellcaster. As Baron is surrounded by jets and swirls of magical energy. The hero understands that everything is lost and he can't do anything. He feels death approaching. But something, nevertheless, tells me that it should not stop. He just can't accept what's happening around him. And stop. A huge ball of magical energy flies straight at Baron. I am Sarisha's sword. What's that? He exclaims. He hears enemies approaching. There are many of them, and they approach calmly and unhurriedly. This is Vulcan, the Kyrus Mage Corps. And the man who started it all is Planchet, the Mad King of Kyrus. Baron grits his teeth in frustration. These scoundrels had created hell for his homeland. A long-haired young man in a white magician's robe steps out of the crowd. He greets Baron and introduces himself as Arkin, the Valken leader. He asks Baron to introduce himself in return, but Baron claims that he has forgotten his name. I am just a sword that serves the king, he exclaims loudly, and desperately, ignoring the lost arm, charges at the enemies. Arkin grins and casts some sort of spell. He raises his hand, flowing with crystals of white energy, and says that he will remember Baron. King of Sekresha, magical energy is unleashed on the hero. His sword goes flying. At this moment, Baron's entire life flashes before his eyes. Childhood, youth, defeat of the beloved homeland, and the last rays of light. It's time to wake up Prince the hero hears a gentle female voice. A blue-eyed girl holding a bell asks if he slept well today and if his dreams were pleasant. The hero abruptly jumps out of bed, scaring the girls. The blue-eyed one, calling him a prince, says that he must hurry since Prince Planchet has already left. This name shocks the hero. What is Planchet? He looks down at his hand and can't believe he has it it was cut off during the battle, I remember. He says this out loud, causing the maids to be taken aback. They think that his highness has gone mad. Someone cut off his beautiful hand one asks the other maybe he had a nightmare. The girls ask the hero if everything is in order. He, in turn, has a name running through his head that he hates more than anything else in the world. An inexplicably overgrown hand, maids he had never seen before. His brain is filled with memories that don't belong to him at all. Who am I? He asks the girls. They can't believe their ears. They say his name is Kalyan Rhine Kyrus, the third prince of Kyrus. This is some kind of monstrous nightmare the hero thinks to himself. The hero recalls that a maidservant named him Kalyan Rain Kali, the third prince of Kyrus. He can't shake the shock. He looks down at his miraculously grown arm and remembers the people who came to kill him on the battlefield. What's going on, he thinks. What date is it today? The hero asks the maid standing by his bed. One of the girls replies that it's April 28. And what year? Baron still asks excitedly. 522, the maid answers. It can't be, the main character thinks, sweating with excitement. That's ten years earlier. The last war. The war started because of the time axis. This strange object, which has the power to reverse time, appeared in the royal palace of Sekersha completely unexpectedly. Its fame quickly spread, and the Kyrus, the dominant power of the continent, decided that they also wanted to be the owners of such an artifact. 
Theron remembers a council meeting that discussed the Kyrus demand to give them the time access. The meeting then decided that this ultimatum was completely absurd and no one would give them anything. It's a powerful state, of course, but the Axis belongs to the Secretes by all accounts. Giving such a dangerous item to the enemy would be complete madness. Having been refused, they went to war, and the Secretians had the impression that the enemies were waiting for this occasion. Theron remembers the scene of saying goodbye to Chase Hyuna. All those who had gone to war were dead by then, and he desperately begged Baron not to follow the same path. Losing the others would be unbearable for Chase. And then, most likely, he saw Baron die. If only we could go back to a time when this terrible artifact wasn't there yet. Wait a minute, Baron thinks. He sees the time axis in front of him as if in reality. He jumps out of bed. The girls try to stop him, but in vain. Baron goes to the window. Feverish thoughts run through his head. What if Chase Hunam turned time with the axis? What if he gave one last chance to prevent the destruction of his homeland, Sekresha? The head maid turns politely to Baron. She understands that it may not be easy for him to participate in the general morning meal right now. It is somehow indecent to linger any longer. But Baron has already come to his senses. Beaming with joy, he apologizes to the girls for causing trouble and promises to get ready as soon as possible. He's going to take this opportunity to fix everything, even if it means being a prince of Kairos. One of the servants in the luxurious dining room of the palace solemnly announces the approach to the table for the purpose of eating the third prince Callion. Someone's already eating here. The maid who woke Baron apologizes, whispering in his ear that it was her fault that he was late. She should have started waking him earlier. She didn't think that Prince Randall would be here first and quite early. We see a sign that says First Prince Randall Sile Kyrus. All three princes of Kyrus are half-brothers to each other and are members of the ruling dynasty of the Holy State of Tensel. By order of the king, breakfast is prepared every morning for all three princes. If Baron's memories were to be believed, the one who sipped tea peacefully at the table had always treated Callion as if he were nothing. The real third prince always hated it like hell. Baron realizes that Hemi's missing from the table. And here he is, slowly approaching the table in slippers. The servant's solemn announcement of the arrival of the second Prince Planchet confirms the hero's expectation. Baron looks at his half-brother with utter bewilderment. What is this all about, he thinks. Planchet's shirt is wide open, revealing the prominent muscles of his chest. Is there any other person of royal blood in the whole world who walks around looking like this? Thinks Baron to himself. Was this the mad king he knew from the future? One of the girls pours Planchet some tea. Judging by his outfit, he might have gotten his nickname for a completely different reason, Baron grins to himself. If he remembers correctly, the first prince can't put the second prince in his place right now. The current queen of Kyrus is Planchet's biological mother. No one in the royal palace dares to challenge her in any way, even in this way. Baron raises his cup to his lips and takes a sip of tea. It seems that it will be very difficult to survive in this viper pit. Planchet doesn't like the way Baron drinks his tea. Without changing a bit in his face, but with a fair amount of contempt, he reproaches the third prince for not having a drop of nobility in him, and in this he took after his mother. Baron's fists clench in anger, but we must be patient. He can't let the last chance Chase Hunam gave him go to waste like this. Nevertheless, something is growing inside of him, and a feeling is rising in his throat. Planchet Rune Kyrus is the man who tore up his homeland. How I want to cut his throat. Right now. How I want to slit his throat, Baron thinks to himself. Planchet notices the unkind look in his stepbrother's eyes. He jumps up abruptly, knocking over his chair, and then throws his cup of tea to the floor. It shatters. How dare you look at me like that? He asks Baron angrily. The first prince slams his cup down on the table and harshly urges his younger brothers to stop squabbling. The table is silent for a while. Planchet breathes heavily and looks at Rundell. Something is clearly pissing him off. Most likely, they are the eyes of Baron, who continues to stare at him. Planchet clutches his head. Then he turns and walks away. According to him, he lost his appetite because of the third prince's disgusting bloody eyes. Baron is surprised. Randall stands up and adjusts the bow around his neck, telling Callion to behave properly. His Majesty the King's birthday is coming up soon, and it would be very inappropriate for family members to approach such a special day with upset feeling. Baron is perplexed, looking after his brother leaving the dining room. Randall seems to blame him for what happened. Not the bad who had broken the cup, knocked over the chair and walked away cursing loudly. Baron is approached by Jan, the maidservant who had woken him up earlier. Startled, she asks if he's all right and if he's hurt. Then she gets down on one knee and starts wiping Baron's tea-spattered boots. Her shoes are also spattered, but the prince is more important to her. Looking at her, Baron thinks that at least he has a loyal servant who genuinely cares for him. Despite all the indignities Callion endured here, day after day, 
He puts a hand on her shoulder and thanks you for your concern. The girl doesn't believe her ears. She expected Prince Kalyan to cry softly, as usual. But he's smiling. First Queen Kyrus, the dragon Kisphanian. She had night black hair and eyes the color of sacred fire. Kalyan is the only prince who has inherited the features of her appearance. However, he never had much strength. Kalyan always tried to hide his red eyes. Not least because Planchet hated them. The reason for this obsessive fear is clear. Kalyan's memories come back to Baron. It turns out that he could read the minds of those he looked at. He himself was uncomfortable and afraid to look into someone else's mind. So he always looked away. What an idiot, Baron thinks of the third prince in whose body he now resides. Jan comes up to him and asks if he needs anything from her. Baron suggests simply returning to his chambers. The girl notices that the prince behaved very strangely this morning and asks what it might be related to. Maybe last night he read some chivalrous novel. Baron refutes this assumption. The third prince was born from the king's relationship with a peasant concubine. He was afraid of everything and could not rely on anyone's support. He was weak and couldn't stand up for himself. Baron remembers that shortly before his 15th birthday. How old am I now? He asks Jan, breaking out in a cold sweat. She makes big eyes and replies that she will be 15 in four months. So, shortly before the specified date, Kalyan died. He tried to poison Queen Kellek, but failed. Fearing retribution, he hanged himself. So, at least, the public was informed. No one, however, believed this version. That means they'll be coming for Baron soon. The third prince walks briskly to the window. The maids are terrified and ask him to stop. They are afraid that he will jump out there. The real Kalyan is only a month or two away from dying. Baron doesn't know what really happened to him, so he can't just wait obediently for this moment. He asks Jan to give him a pair of scissors. She asks again if she misheard. The instrument ends up in Baron's hands. Ian, horrified, asks why the third prince needed scissors. He plays with them, smiling slyly. Then he says that they will help him fix everything. If the future is preordained, I'll just try to turn it a little to the side, he thinks as he cuts the long bangs that help hide his eyes. The maids are screaming frantically, begging him to stop. Prince Planchet is clearly not going to like this trick. Baron replies that he can't live like an idiot forever, just because someone doesn't like something about him. He asks the girls to calm down, promising to take care of everything. Planchet enters the room, his face contorted with disgust. You are mad, he says to Baron. Ian screams in horror, is this how the hell he took care of everything? Ian screams in horror. An enraged Planchet enters the room. During the next breakfast Planchet turns to his younger brother. He calmly replies that his name is Kalyan. Just Kalyan. Ah, uh, yes, I should call you, says the second prince. His eyes fill with rage. By name and a table knife flies towards Baron. The maids are terrified. Jan screams. The knife goes straight for her, but it doesn't reach us. Baron catches him in mid-flight, injuring his palm quite badly. His red eyes glow with determination. Ian excitedly asks how serious his highness injury is. Planchet, looking at Baron, who still holds the knife in his hand, pretends to apologize for the fact that it accidentally slipped out of his hand. No way, Kalyan hurt his little hand, he says mockingly. Baron grins. He tells Brother Planchet that he is all right, and places the bloody knife right in front of the second prince. He is clearly puzzled by what is happening. Kalyan had changed too much. On the table in front of Baron are bandages, some medical supplies, and medical forceps. Jan is sure they should call the doctor, but Baron refuses to do so. He convinces her that the wound is not serious. Moreover, he himself has questions for the girl. Why didn't you dodge earlier? He asks. You knew the knife was coming at you. What would you have done if I hadn't intercepted him? Baron, it turns out, looked into her thoughts during the attack. She replies that she was standing still, as Planchet could have used her evasion to harm the Kalyan. Suddenly Baron feels a little uneasy. He says that his heart rate has accelerated due to the bleeding. To calm down, he will go to wash, and asks no one to go with him. Jan is going to help him after all, but Baron forbids her to do this, as well as to call the doctor in his absence. Once behind the curtain, Baron watches Jan and reads her thoughts. She is very upset that he forbade her to call a doctor. Shortly before that, he saw in the same head a subconscious urge to use the aura to defend against Planchet's attack. But then I felt a sharp stabbing pain in my heart. It would be nice to replay this situation again, Baron thinks. This will allow you to better understand the state of the body Kaliana. The hero scans the body he got and discovers something very surprising inside it. Near the heart, he sees three circles of mana. Kalyan was a mage. A few days later, Jan examines Baron's wound. It's been three days and it hasn't even lasted, although the third prince, oddly enough, doesn't care. A fat man with a mustache and a red suit is standing behind Jan, announcing that all preparations are complete. 
This is Sethan Slake, the royal tailor. He looks at Baron with strange eyes, and Baron asks what caused this look. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, but Freya. The tailor starts to say, but Jan, standing behind Baron, interrupts him sharply, shouting his name. After Baron has cut his hair, this reaction occurs regularly in others, and this begins to tire our hero. Kalyan suffered greatly from being so much like his mother, whom he had never met. He hated his appearance so much that he smashed all the mirrors in his room. But Baron does not suffer from this at all. He informs the tailor that he is aware of his similarity to Freya, and tells him to do what he came here for. First, Sethan wants to take measurements. Measuring Baron's body parameters, the tailor says that he needs to eat more, he is too thin for his age. Baron convinces Sethan that he doesn't suffer from a lack of appetite. But looking at himself in the mirror, he realizes that his appearance may indeed cause concern to others. The Kairos royal family is descended from dragons. To be more precise, its founders were two of the eight heroes who walled up the evil god. Their names were Kachara and Sisphanian. From the Sisphanian, the Kairos inherited the power of healing and a magical ability called Sisphanian Blessing. In other words, Kalyan's wound should have healed a long time ago, but it didn't. And every time Baron uses magic, he is disturbed by the pain in his heart. If this goes on, he won't be able to use or or magic when an assassin comes after him. Sethan says he will bring the clothes he has prepared for his highness for the king's birthday. Baron, meanwhile, wonders if anyone knows about the mana he found near the heart. The tailor's words about his birthday make him turn away from these thoughts. This event will definitely be attended by he, the great magician Ellen Manessel. He had to meet this person, Ellen Manessel. He's only one of the three or four magicians of the Seventh Circle, and a true idol for all magicians. In the past, Ellen Manessel was invited to the king's birthday party and came to Kyrus. And the story of how, as a result of an incident, he was denied entry to the city right at the gate, reached the neighboring state of Sekrasha. Ellen Manessel, who was unable to participate in the celebration at the time, was the first person on the continent ten years later to be elevated to level eight Grand Magi and proved to have the appropriate ability. No one knows Mana better than he does. If anyone can help solve this body's problems, Baron thinks it's him. But the hero does not know exactly what incident prevented Ellen from entering the palace. In Kairos, mages are generally not well regarded, so there's no way to be sure that Ellen will agree to help him. Many knights come to Kairos, mostly because Planchet's mother's family, the Brisson family, is very influential. Baron believes that he needs magic power at least as a weapon against the Brysons. If he could make Ellen his ally, then the war Planchet would start could be averted. A little earlier, Baron watches with displeasure as the mates and the tailor discuss the size of the ribbons on his suit, which is being prepared for the grand event, and decides that he must put an end to this squabble. No ribbons or other gadgets, he says flatly. Baron drinks tea without getting out of bed, and Jan is standing next to the window, looking thoughtfully out into the garden, where a sparrow is sitting on a branch. After finishing his tea, the hero puts the cup on the saucer. I think I'm getting used to these realities, he thinks. The cut on his arm has healed, and Planchet has simply ignored it since the incident, which is probably just as well. Jan informs Basen that he has a writing lesson in the morning and is having lunch with the queen and Viscount Brisson. The hero, not believing his ears, asks again, and the maid confirms her words. In her opinion, this meeting may be connected with the planned birthday of the king. Well, they must have met sooner or later, Baron thinks. Ian asks the third prince if he is going to train his stamina today. He replies that it's just a jog in front of the lake behind the palace, and asks the girl not to worry about him, he will be fine. But, something goes wrong while running. Baron bends over, panting and sweating cold. He feels like he's going to die. A red-haired girl runs up behind him. Startled, she asks if Baron is alright. This is Marilyn Fyan, Callian's maid and daughter of the commander of the Outer Guard. On the first day, four and a half laps, on the third, four, and today. Baron does not understand what is happening to him. He is training his stamina, and it is only getting worse. Marilyn suggests that Baron still see a doctor, but he refuses, again repeating that everything is fine with him. He is sure that the doctor will immediately detect mana circles in him. Even Ian doesn't know that Callian is a mage. If Darren is found out, then his life may be in danger. He tells Marilyn that the doctor can't help him. These specialists don't deal with losing stamina. The girl tries to object, but the hero interrupts her, promising that everything will improve over time. They hear loud cheers from nearby. As they turn towards the source of the sounds, they realize that the knight's training has begun there. The armored young men are enthusiastically hitting each other with their swords. In the midst of this crowd stands an experienced warrior, who points out the flaws of the young ones. He gives orders that his charges follow without hesitation. This picture reminds Baron of scenes from his past life. Marilyn, who is standing next to him, 
informs him that this is the training ground of the Pable Knights Corps. The prince replies that he knows about it. He watched the soldiers, because he is very interested in what they do. This discourages the girl. Callian, whom she knows, has never picked up a sword. Baron says that he would love to join the training. But Marilyn urges him to remember how difficult it is to train in the Papal Knights Corps. Baron replies that such loads are understandable, because these are the knights of the Brezen family, on which, in fact, the royal power rests. Suddenly, the conversation is interrupted by a rude call from the side. The man who was commanding the young soldiers approaches Baron and Marilyn, and says that they have nothing to do in this place. This is Pabel, the commander of the Knight Corps. He says that his charges are distracted by this couple and it annoys him. Marilyn interrupts Pabel's speech with a menacing voice she declares that this is Crown Prince Callian and advises him to show the appropriate rank of respect. Wow, Prince Callian, the Knight Corps commander says thoughtfully. I thought, like some rat that's spying on me. How bold, Baron thinks. Prince Callian, and I took him for someone else. A peeping rat. Baron is surprised at this audacity. But for some reason, he starts to smile. He feels something unexpected. Marilyn is outraged. She's seething with rage. She lashes out at Pabel for daring to speak so shamelessly to the prince. The old soldier tries to justify himself, muttering some nonsense. Why all this tenderness and subtlety? He asks, even if the prince is all out of control. Baron, meanwhile, telepathically gets into his head and finds a very interesting memory. Pabel was driving up to the palace at the queen's summons when he met Callian on the way. The order's commander then rudely demanded that the prince step out of the way, and the prince, without a murmur, apologized and pressed himself against the wall. Baron understands that his predecessor was a weak-willed, cowardly little man. Now he stares boldly at Pabel and feels how surprised he is at this transformation. The soldier even begins to be afraid of him. Darren calmly approaches the commander of the guard corps and asks him to answer just one question. Looking straight into his eyes, he says, What is your duty? Pabel's face breaks out in a cold sweat, clearly shaken. This is also noticed by the young knight standing a little further away. They ask their commander if he's all right. This is really the third prince, they whisper to each other, seeing the unenviable state of their commander. And Callian was despised even by these youngsters, Baron realizes. Gathering her courage and putting on an expression more appropriate to her status, Pabel tells Baron that he is currently conducting a class, so he can't answer the question put to him yet. He also asks the prince to mind his own business. Baron sharply rebukes Pabel. I asked you a question, he says angrily. What is your duty? Both Marilyn and the knight commander stare in shock at the transformed third prince. With fear in his eyes, Pabel reports that he must strengthen the power of the royal family and protect both it and the kingdom. Without realizing it, he snapped to attention. That's right, strengthen and protect. But you can't do either, Baron grabs a tree branch and breaks it off. Gritting his teeth, Pabel asks for an explanation of what he is accused of. Holding a stick in his hands, Baron says that strengthening the power of the royal family is not possible for the commander, since what he saw with his own eyes in training. This is something obscene. Armed only with a stick, Baron lunges at Pabel. He understands that if he does not manage to block the blow, then he will miss a blow that, if the opponent had a real sword, would have been fatal. The old warrior jerks his sword out of its scabbard. He tries to fend off a stick flying straight at his neck. Without success, two weapons collide. Baron lets go of the stick. And Pabel is a sword that clatters to the cobblestones. I can't believe that you can't predict the attacks of someone who has never held a real sword in his life. I'm very disappointed Baron mocks. Now for the second point. Pabel can't believe what she's seeing. What the hell? Where does this determination, this murderess will come from? He thinks. The third prince, meanwhile, continues, protecting the members of the royal family and the kingdom. You've just been snubbing a member of the royal family, and then you've raised your sword against the prince, who, by the way, has a sore arm right now, Baron says quite calmly. Should I consider it treason? Pabel is seized with a kind of animal horror. This is not the third prince he knew before. I was not myself. He tries to justify himself, and falls prostrate in front of Baron, who is rubbing his bruised arm. The order commander humbly laments that he did not intend to commit treason. In front of the stunned young knights, he begs them to spare him. Baron, meanwhile, reads his real thoughts. Pabel would never forgive this humiliation from a royal puppy. Jan is genuinely perplexed. She took Baron to endurance training, and now he is walking around with a horse. It doesn't seem to fit. But the third prince smiles at the bewilderment on the girl's face. He says he picked up the raven on the way here. The prince hands over the reins of the animals to a man. Ian struggles to keep Raven at bay, but manages to ask where Baron got him. After Pabel humbly apologized, Baron turned his attention to the horse, which was being held back with difficulty by several soldiers. 
They told him that Prince Planchet had not been able to tame him. The animal was indeed showing a very violent temper. Baron had an idea. He went up to the servants, yelled at them for the improper handling of Prince Planchet's horse, and very quickly tamed it. While Ian tries to restrain Raven, Baron asks Marilyn not to tell anyone about what happened today near the Night Corps training ground. Jan shouts loudly that if Planchet finds out about the fate of his horse, he will be really angry. But Baron calms her down. Suddenly, his face contorts with intense pain, and he grabs his arm. He seems to have overexerted the previous owner's fragile body again. The girls ask if it's because he went too far in endurance training. But Baron says he's fine and just had a good time with nice people. Meanwhile, someone is watching the trio from around the corner. Baron hurries Jan a little more and he will be late for the scheduled lunch. She replies that she will do everything now, but does not understand what to do with the horse that she is holding by the bridle. Prince, does it not bite? She asks. I don't know, Baron replies. Sunny day, magnificent gazebo with thick columns and elegant arches. Inside, a bald figure is sitting on a chair with a flower in her hands, and a second figure is standing next to her at the table. So what did he say? The person sitting down asks. How interesting. Very appropriate. I've heard that even worms wriggle when stepped on, he continues. Suddenly, the hand abruptly breaks the flower in half. Let it wriggle, it will not be able to change its essence. The figure throws the flower on the floor and says, just crushing it wouldn't be fun, so everything is going according to plan. Let's wait until. Baron is sitting at the dinner table. He can't get used to the atmosphere here. Next to him, the first and second princes of Kairos sit staring off into space. Planchet's face looks distant and impassive. Doctor doesn't seem to have much energy today, Baron thinks. While everyone is silent, he continues to make sense of what is happening. Could it be that the Queen and Viscount Brezen are being delayed because of him? Planchet can't control the expression on his face, he's still a child inside. Suddenly, all three of them smell a pleasant floral fragrance. Randall and Baron get to their feet. The latter's face is filled with joyful anticipation. She's finally here. The real ruler of this kingdom. Kellick Bryson is the second queen, the current queen of Kyrus. Kellick became queen after her predecessor died of an illness. Behind her was the power of the Bryson family, and she was able to bend the core of royal knights to her will. Most of the nobility also supported the Brysons. Kellick's influence grew day by day. As a result, the third prince, Callion, who did not gain even a shred of power, became a laughing stock even for ordinary warlords. And then let's do the following with Pabel, the Viscount says to the queen, laughing merrily. Yes, let's pay adequate compensation, she says, and don't tell me about such trifles in the future. The queen should not pay attention to every little thing. The company that was supposed to have lunch together today finally gathered. Kellick addresses Baron, albeit as Callion. She says he's grown up a lot lately. The hero is pleased to hear this. He had expected this reaction. He says quietly that he hasn't grown very much. Yes, this is exactly the right reaction. In the future, the third prince is confident that it will grow much larger. Kellick looks at him blankly, then thoughtfully. Finally, with some kind of trick, the Viscount intervenes. He says that he doesn't know how much Baron has grown, but that he has changed a lot, almost beyond recognition. And all because of the new haircut, which should have been done much earlier. Viscount Renan Brisson is the second son of the Marquis of Brisson. And you'll grow up again. Don't doubt it, the Viscount continues to chatter. Kellick calls out to him, and he remembers that they've also come here to eat. Bring food, he orders the servants. Just think of the imbecile who rules this country. Baron muses, the rumors are true, and it's just wonderful. Kellick, covering the lower part of his face with a fan, glances at Baron. Planchet, she says to her son. Why didn't you tell me? About a horse that refused to listen to you. He doesn't know what to say. He looks away. You should have told me, she chides him. Planchet replies that she has already found out about everything. What, you didn't listen at all? The queen continues to ask. She was good for nothing from the very beginning. Her son answers her. Then he gets up and says he has to go. Kellick calls out to him urgently. She doesn't like his behavior at all. Three weeks later. Annual celebrations on the occasion of the king's birthday. People are bustling around the city square decorating it with flowers and other decorative elements. You need to do a lot, and at the same time avoid making stupid mistakes that are not forgiven here. Several carts pass through the square. Onlookers whisper that this is a delegation that brought gifts from the elves. The festive feast promises to be very rich. In the crowd, they discuss the princes who should show up in chic outfits. People want to see these masterpieces of tailoring art as soon as possible. Seth and Slake, meanwhile, continues to take Baron's measurements. He stares at the measuring tape in disbelief. Your Highness, you ate. The tailor's eyes are glazed, and large drops of sweat roll down his face. Baron's nose is bleeding. The third prince looks down at his palm in fright. Drops of blood on the floor. 
Baron looks down at his bloody hand in disbelief. Jan and the other maids, who are watching the tailor's work, run to the prince. Ian orders the girls to bring some cloth as soon as possible. Baron, holding his nose, tries to convince her that he is all right. He says it's probably because he hasn't been sleeping well lately. Besides, he thinks the blood's almost stopped. Ian can look at it for herself to make sure. But Seth and Slake has another piece of bad news. After apologizing for interrupting the conversation, he reveals that the prince has lost even more weight since the last fitting. Three weeks ago, the parameters of his figure were more impressive than those shown by the measuring tape today. Baron looks at the tailor incredulously. Did I really lose that much? Maybe this is due to the fact that I do a lot of physical exercises, he asks. Then Baron begins to think. He does train hard, but it only makes his stamina worse. And then there's the pain when he uses mana. This body must really have some kind of heart problem. Sethan excitedly tells Darren not to take what's going on so lightly. The prince should have been checked out by a doctor long ago. He laughs. What was he supposed to complain about? The nosebleed. Inside, he's very uncomfortable. This blood has scared half a dozen not-so-bad people. It was very inconvenient. Sethan tries to convince him again. What you need to go to the doctor. But Jan interrupts him. Folding her arms across her chest, she declares out loud that she knows the cause of the bleeding, although it is not very convenient to say it out loud. This is because the prince picked his nose yesterday. He has such a bad habit. The maids cover their mouths and giggle softly. The tailor looks at Jan in disbelief. Ta confirms what she said once again. Prince Kalyan is eating well and training hard. The nosebleed is most likely due to his bad habit, so there's no need to worry. Sethan has no choice but to agree with this conclusion. Jan spends much more time with the prince and probably knows him better. The girl winks at Baron, unnoticed by the others. He looks at her in amazement. That's a lousy one. He thinks. They'd had a conversation earlier. The girl noticed that Baron did not look very well, and he confessed that he was getting worse. Then he talked about how he could use magic and mana. And now she's spoiling his image in front of everyone in this way. However, she solved the problem, so you need to be grateful. Okay, then I'm going to make a suit, says Seth and Slake. There is almost no time left before the event, so we must hurry. Ian calms him down. The prince has some other things to do, so Sethan should have time to do everything in the best possible way. This news pleases the tailor, and he says that he will first make a robe for the ceremony. That will take place in the afternoon. Jan, meanwhile, whispers to Baron, it's today, isn't it? He stares blankly at nothing. If things continue like this, his health problems will be known to the entire palace very soon. This means that in the evening, at all costs, he must meet with Alon Manassel. His Highness has urgent business to attend, so he has to cancel the general dinner, a man with a long mustache tells Baron. But in return, he will meet everyone face to face. Baron is perplexed. There is no time to meet with everyone at once, but wants to have personal conversations with everyone. Something here doesn't fit in with normal human logic. In any case, he and Yang follow the servant who meets him. He stops in front of a red door guarded by two warriors with long pikes and gestures for Baron to go inside. The hero did not expect a personal meeting, so he is noticeably nervous. Come in, prince, his highness is waiting, he hears. Once inside, Baron sees a man sitting at a table. He's reading some papers. This is Romain Laroon Kyrus, king of Kyrus. Baron bows and greets him. The answer is silence. The third prince doesn't understand what's going on. Is he ignoring me? He thinks, maybe I don't know the local etiquette very well, but it's rude anyway, Baron reflects. Sit down here, the king finally says. Baron sits down and congratulates Romain on his 38th birthday. He dryly thanks the visitor and asks how he is doing. Then he adds that the prince looks surprisingly good. Baron sees the worried faces of Jan and Sethan, who demand that he see a doctor. Even the servants who come in know that something is wrong with him. Baron understands why the king decided to talk to everyone separately, despite the apparent lack of time. If he meets all his sons at once, he will need to maintain a multifaceted conversation, and one-on-one -on -one communication is much more effective. He doesn't seem to really want to see his family members. The more Baron gets to know these people, the less he understands them. A father who doesn't care about his sons. The first prince, completely indifferent to everything that happens around him. A second prince who has no idea about etiquette. And, always late, but one who doesn't care about nothing at all. A queen who has enough power to look down on the king. And one of these men wants to kill Baron. Who is it? Who sent the assassin after him? In the town square, onlookers discuss the king's birthday celebrations. The main news in the complete transformation of Callion the Third Prince. The other man, Planchet, looked ridiculous in comparison. Courtiers reassure themselves that this is idle talk, and everything will remain the same as it was. But even they understand that something has changed. Everyone has this feeling. 
The third prince, Kalyan, strode into the palace, and all eyes were on him. The rumors weren't lying. The black-haired, red-eyed prince looked very much like a Kisphanian. He cut off the hair that covered his eyes. He even wore a blood-colored brooch. This may be a declaration that it will no longer hide. He was sparkling with happiness. Prince, why everyone? Jan whispers in Baron's ear, looking at your outfit. Her eyes glow with delight. That's because you look absolutely amazing in it, right? Sethan will be very happy. No, they are wondering how the third prince dared to put on such a precious stone, Baron replies. You have no idea how difficult it is to stop our tailor. It's a good thing he stopped there. If I'd been wearing everything he offered, it would have been much worse. Jan continues to glow with joy. She says that Baron should not worry. He looks really great. But Jan and Baron don't know what's really going on. The choice of brooch for the celebration was very frivolous. You once said that your family lives in the capital, Kyrases. The third prince asks his companion. She replies that her sister and father stayed in her hometown, and the rest of the family moved to Kyrases. Baron asks if they will come to the royal palace. The girl says that this requires an invitation. After that, she asks what time she should bring Raven to the garden. But the prince doesn't seem to want to answer that question. He pauses briefly, and then vaguely replies that it should be done on time. Then Baron explains that he wants to see someone. The prince asks if Jan knows why this ballroom is called Siegfried's Hall. She knows that in honor of the first patriarch and one of the eight heroes of the two-way war, Duke Quitros Han Siegfried. The Siegfrieds are the only dukes in Kairos. Despite their great power, they remained loyal to the royal family for at least 500 years. Their sole purpose was to protect the Kisphanian territory. Baron recalls how deeply this story inspired him in a previous life. Jan says she seems to know who Baron wants to see. He confirms her guess. It wasn't very difficult to come up with it. Here is a showy bearded man who, holding a glass of wine in front of his face, says that Siegfried's summer night is an eternal classic. Baron looks directly at him. This is Duke Schleiman Han Siegfried. Before us is a spectacular sign with this name. A family that has been loyal for hundreds of years is a very nice person, Baron thinks. Then maybe, is it worth checking out how fast he is? The hero's hand begins to emit a faint stream of white energy. Schleiman Han Siegfried is instantly alarmed. His eyes turn to the balcony where Baron and Jan are standing. He found me instantly, Baron thinks. Even though the energy flow I showed was very weak. Jan notices that Duke Siegfried is interested in the third prince and tells him so. He continues to speculate. Schleichman is one of the five sword masters of this continent, so he should have discovered its energy. Thank you very much, of course. But it's still too early. He asks his maid to act as if nothing has happened. They walk slowly away from the balcony, the duke still watching them go. The king comes to the fore. He thanks everyone who congratulated him and invites everyone present to enjoy the evening. To Kyrus, he says in a toast. Baron and Jan take the rope down from the balcony, the prince first, his maid next. Raven, on whom Baron is sitting, behaves in the most exemplary way, although Jan warns that you can expect any dirty tricks from him. The prince refuses to believe this, he sees that this is a very smart and quick-witted horse. They approach the city gate at a leisurely pace. It's already night, but the streets of the city are well lit. You can't do it without permission, comes a voice from the city gate. The guard tells Kyrus's guest that he has come a long way, but he can't let it go. It's him. Baron realizes with undisguised joy. The newcomer asks the guard again if he really refuses to let him in because of the lack of an invitation, and informs him that his name is Ellen Manassel. Ellen Manessel. At the city gate, a horseman in monastic robes stands in front of the guards. The warriors look at him, puzzled. They look at each other, not knowing what they're supposed to do. The commander steps forward and tells Ellen that despite all his words, he must present the invitation. A smile appears on Ellen's face. So Kyrus divides his guests by what they look like, he asks the guards. Baron, sitting on Raven, hears what the conversation is about, and it surprises him a little. Judging people by their looks isn't good, he thinks. But Ellen Manessel seems to be deliberately provoking the guards. It seems that he does not want to enter Kyrus, and does everything to be turned around at the gate. Okay, then I'll go back, Ellen says, and turns his horse away from the gate. Baron begins to panic, he must meet with Manessel. The hero is about to ride after Alon, but Jan tries to stop him. According to her, the king forbade anyone to leave the city during the celebrations. Baron looks after Ellen with despair in his eyes. He can't let it go so easily. He orders Young to do everything possible to stop the guards and put spurs to his horse. The girl shouts after him, but Baron is already rushing toward the city gate. The guards get in his way. They shout to him that the king has forbidden him to leave the city. But Darren just sweeps past them, throwing the men with the pikes aside. Unable to stop the prince, the guards stare helplessly after the rider. 
Then they realize they have to catch up with him. The order is given to mount and catch up with the fugitive. What should I do? Thinks the incomprehensible Jan, who sees the whole picture. She must fulfill the prince's request, whatever it takes. Reminding herself that she serves Prince Kalyan, she tries to think of some plan of action. Jan must protect the prince because it is her direct duty. Stop, she shouts loudly to the guards. Duke Siegfried has allowed Prince Kalyan to leave the city. The warriors are not mad. They ask Jan who she is to throw the duke's name around so freely. She tells them that her name is Saroyan Siegfried, and she is the eldest son of Duke Siegfried. In front of us are the lighted windows of a luxurious palace. Booming laughter comes from inside. Ian, who turns out to be Saroyan, is sitting with his head bowed sadly next to a laughing man. Don't laugh about it, he says. He wipes away his tears and apologizes. He can't believe that his son did such a smart thing. The same little boy who was growing up in front of his eyes. He once again praises the offspring for a successful decision. Jan replies that it may not have been a good one. His father's relationship with the king must have noticeably deteriorated as a result of what happened. The father reassures his son. He doesn't believe his ears. Schleiman repeats that the king will do nothing. According to him, the monarch takes any event too seriously, which is why he calculates its consequences far ahead. If the third prince received help from the Siegfrieds, it means that he now depends on the latter's goodwill. If there is a relationship and help received, but no punishment, then this is tantamount to recognizing the sweet relationship between the Siegfrieds and the prince. The Brysons should not be satisfied with this, no matter how confusing these logical twists may seem. So the king will probably pretend that nothing happened. Baron catches up with Ellen Manessel and starts a conversation with him. I don't think you're going to criticize me for not having an invitation, he tells him, anticipating a possible question. Ellen then asks why the third prince of Kyrus is chasing the old man. His face looks very young. Baron is shocked. He knew that when a magician reaches the seventh level, he begins to grow younger. But he was not sure that this was true, but now it is clear that it is true. Anyway, he asks Ellen if he's going to go back to town, since it's late at night. When I tried to open the closed door, the threshold was too high, he replies cryptically. This intricate language amuses Baron. If Ellen wants to use metaphors, he can respond in kind. But you came to a closed door when there is an open one nearby. In simple terms, this means that Ellen did not want to take out the invitation that he had. I was blocking out the wind and forgot to dust off the doorstep. Stands for I didn't expect the guards to make such a mistake when filtering the human flow. Ellen mentally evaluates the other person. He criticizes me, not apologizes. Is he that honest or just shameless? I think I like him. He doesn't have the look of a 14-year-old boy, that's for sure. Suddenly, Ellen feels something strange. He calls out loudly to Baron, who starts in surprise. Excusing himself, he grabs Baron's arm as he sits on the horse and pulls him sharply to him. The prince tries to resist, but he just doesn't have the strength. He feels a terrible, unbearable pain in his chest. Ellen holds Baron's hand tightly. The prince's face is contorted with pain, and he clutches at his heart, but he knows what is happening now, Ellen's mana is pouring into him. The place where the hero's hands meet sparkles with magical energy. Unable to bear the unbearable pain, Baron at one point pulls his arm out of Ellen's grip. The prince collapses on Raven's withers. Even a closed door can't completely stop the wind, Ellen says metaphorically. Still holding his heart, tears falling from his eyes, Baron looks at the wizard it's amazing how he realized almost immediately that something was wrong with the prince's body. Closed door, wind, right. He thinks, yes, that's right, he says out loud. Ellen, in turn, also assesses what happened. At some point, he couldn't use any mana. It's not about her, the wizard thinks. Doesn't he know that the problem is of a completely different nature? Ellen is lost in memories. He clenches his fists tightly. The Kairos have a bad attitude towards magicians due to the fact that they are descendants of dragon. The great magician came to this family by himself to mock them for not noticing the great magician under their noses. But is it possible to call the meeting with this young prince fateful? Baron looks at Ellen with a pained expression. He asks why the prince was looking for him. He starts to speak, but stops. A magician recognizes lies, Baron realizes. Ellen Manassel, he says. I think. He's still not very sure if he's doing it right. Dot 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 that my life is in danger. Ellen's thoughts. I know what a difficult situation the third prince is in. Everyone hates him. He is surrounded on all sides by enemies. Ellen's mind flashes over all these opponents, including Queen Selys. To Baron's shock, a reddish sphere appears around him and the other person, consisting of hexagons attached to each other. Silence magic. Baron wonders. He applied it. Without saying a word, it looks like he's actually a level 7 mage. Do you want to Ellen asks Baron. Just make sure it doesn't happen. Or do you need to solve the problem at the root? 
The prince looks at the mage with honest eyes. For now, I'm trying to make sure that doesn't happen. For now, the wizard wonders. But Baron adds that it would be highly desirable to nip the problem in the bud. And he is ready for this, even if it means taking the local throne. This will really allow us to fulfill our ultimate goal, Baron thinks to himself. Ellen is also thinking. In front of him is a prince whose body is gradually dying. He went to Kasfanian, that's for sure. This prince really needs him, level 7 mage Ellen. Then give me the invitation again. Please, the wizard says, looking very kindly at Baron. He lowers his eyes gratefully. Crouching on one knee and pressing his hand to his chest, the third prince says. I, Kalyan Rain Kyrus, greetings to my master. I, Ellen Manessel, accept his highness invitation. Save him. The mage replies, inspired. It seems like the beginning of a great friendship. Do you think the people in the royal palace really don't know who I am? He was, as it turned out, an orphan. He calms the offspring, saying that everything has been taken care of. The guy sighs with relief, as otherwise he wouldn't be able to be around his highness. Schleiman has a low opinion of his son. He believes that there is very little royal in him. Saroyan thoughtfully asks his father how Leia is doing. There's a sad look on his face. Schleiman, smiling, replies that she is doing a great job in the position that his son left. And he says that if Saroyan gets tired of playing the third prince's maid, he can always come back. Then he tells me that they probably won't see each other again for some time. The son finds out what this is connected with, and then says goodbye to Schleiman for three months. The latter finally asks if Saroyan is really going to leave his current job. Schleiman asks his son if he is really going to stop looking after the scoundrel prince. The guy clenches his hands together nervously. He says that his ward will soon turn 15. The father calls out Saroyan's name. Then she asks if he knows what the Siegfried family's nickname is. He answers correctly, and this pleases the man. That's right, he says, the elephants of Kyrus. We never wanted the throne, but they were very powerful. Like real elephants, we could easily trample on any lions that are considered to be the kings of wildlife. No one could have attacked us. Saroyan asks why his father is telling him about this. But the man just grabs him by the neck and starts choking him, laughing out loud. Why not? Because my name, which he refused, is very strong, the father replies. But you, do whatever you want, I won't bother you. Schleiman gently hugs his son, and he snuggles up to him. Suddenly, the elder Siegfried pounces on his offspring again. He screams desperately, trying to break free. You're going to kill me, he warns his overly affectionate father. Well, Duke Siegfried, says Saroyan, adjusting the bow around his neck. Don't show off, says Schleiman, sprawled on a bench. See you later, then, the son says, bowing politely. The duke looks at his son's retreating back. He grimaces, cursing the heir's pointless stubbornness. But he can't help but admit that he feels like the true Siegfried. But, Kalian, who is served by Saroyan, that scoundrel. When did he grow up like this, Schleiman thinks to himself. Magnificent square in front of the royal palace. A smart carriage slowly drives up here. Witnesses to this fashion show are puzzled. Who is it? What does he think of himself? What kind of performance? Is this really the coat of arms? Seven red flowers and a silver cane. The discussion doesn't stop. I heard that his contract with Ruperin ended. But why had he come to Kyrus? Isn't it obvious if he was expecting something like this? If it wasn't for his relationship with King Robert, he would have left long ago. It must be because of that rumor, right? Is it true that Ellen Manassel's son was taken away? Ellen gets out of the carriage. He has a calm, peaceful expression on his face that someone will probably take as evidence of arrogance. My new student did a very nice thing. He thinks, the previous evening, the latter had asked him to drive up to the palace at exactly 9.30. And he said that this time the door will be open. Ellen guesses that the third prince is planning to challenge the Bryson family. It won't be easy for him. He was waiting for the moment to introduce Ellen to the local nobility and shake up the community. The head butler approaches Ellen who is standing in front of the carriage, saying that he is surprised by the unexpected visit of the magician Manassel. But his majesty is waiting for a guest. You need. The king's voice sounds over the table where a cup of tea is placed. A place to stay. In Kyrises, Sir Manassel. The guest confirms what the monarch said. He's lost in thought. To compete with Selys, he would need an ally in the form of Ellen Manassel. But he offered his help first. What is he planning? The suspicious king has doubts. Ellen tries to explain his motives. He says that last night on the square he met a cute black kitten with red eyes. The prankster turned out to be very smart. The magician decided to teach him a couple of things. But for this he needs some kind of dwelling. Ellen laughs. The king asks what exactly the magician is going to teach the kitten. Magic, what else? He replies. But he also wants to create an environment in which the kitten will be comfortable to live. Naturally, to do this, you will need the permission of the owner of the dwelling. 
I'll have to clean up the house, of course, but I can't go anywhere without it. The king seems to be well aware of what exactly lies behind Ellen's metaphors. He asks the magician if he is really capable of coping with the task outline. He says that he has decided to make Prince Callion his disciple, and the Brysons will not be able to stop him. He wouldn't be studying around the clock, so he'd have time for other things, like helping his majesty. If, of course, he is interested in it. And all these thoughts were a real invitation from Prince Callion. He concludes. The king hits his knee with his fist. He abruptly jumps out of his chair and tells Ellen that he is ready to give him a place to stay. This house is already a mess, so it's not going to get any worse. The wizard looks at him with undisguised satisfaction. However, the king wants to clarify something. It seems to him that there is nothing special about the third prince. Nothing special, asks Ellen. He knows that Callion is very special. Take for example the state of his health, which cannot be called normal. The king replies that the guy has a lot of fears. He can't imagine that a child who is even afraid of horses galloped after Ellen and caught up with him. It's very difficult for him. His words shock the magician. Does the king speak only from other people's words? If there was something outstanding about it, I would have been told about it long ago, he confirms his guess. Your majesty, do you even know how tall the prince is? He asks the king. The two men stare at each other intently. Ellen asks the king to tell him how tall the princes are. He's silent, just as the mage suspected. He has no idea about much of what's going on around him. Ellen says that sometimes attention can be a poison, and indifference can be a cure. However, he is well aware that the king's preoccupation with others is just an excuse. The monarch turns angrily to face the mage. Sir Manessel, the king says in a stern voice. He agrees to write off the mage's tactlessness as a concern for his apprentice, Prince Callian. He doesn't want to make excuses, because it looks ridiculous, but he feels that he takes proper care of all the princes, especially about Callian, the boy he values most. The king therefore suggests that the discussion end. Ellen snaps his fingers, and a reddish sphere appears in front of the king. Enough talk, just take a look says the magician. The king is outraged. No one allowed Ellen to use magic inside the palace. Oblivious to his displeasure, Ellen reveals the unpleasant symptoms he noticed in Callian. His lips are dry and his breathing is very weak. His skin has a bluish tinge. And the nails are purple. The clothes were finished in a hurry. If you consider that it began to be made a month ago, the prince has lost a lot of weight during this time. He tried to get up, but couldn't because he felt dizzy. The king can't believe his eyes. Ellen says that if he continues to act like a bystander, the third prince will simply die. Saroyan stands in the doorway of the palace, where he is met by one of the maids. She says it's almost noon. But the prince hasn't even had his morning tea yet. The drink is on a tray. Saroyan takes him, promising to take care of Callian if he starts coughing. The girls enter the prince's chambers. He's still asleep, and frankly, he doesn't look very well. It seems that yesterday's adventures were too exhausting for him. Saroyan tries to wake up the prince. He doesn't react at all, which really bothers him. There is a strange sound in the chamber and Ellen appears in the middle of the room. He starts toward the sleeping prince, and Saroyan yells sharply to stop him. He asks how the mage came to be here in the first place. He calmly replies that outsiders are not allowed to enter the Chermal Palace without an invitation, so we had to move in this way. You teleported because you didn't have an invitation. Saroyan asks, puzzled. The magician replies that he used a subspace jump, which is a little more difficult, but that's okay, since he's very good at magic. Saroyan says that these subtleties don't matter and Ellen should leave as the prince is still very weak. He approaches the interlocutor closely and asks, You know me, don't you? He recalls that Saroyan came to Reburn several years ago. Since then, he has changed a little, but not to the point where it is impossible to recognize him. Isn't that right, baby elephant? He finishes his speech. Saroyan remembers his father. He said that his son does not look like an elephant, so he will never and never suspect him. Now it was discovered, and very quickly. Baron wakes up he calls Jan and asks how long he slept. In response, he hears that a guest has come to him. Cursing, the prince sits up and recognizes his new teacher. He passes him a small red bag. Baron hesitantly unties the ribbon, and mother of pearl beads fall out on his hand. Ellen says that the third prince should eat one of these pills every day. Baron asks if this is a cure, and is told that he has two problems at this particular moment. First, it can't control the mana it has inside it. The second is that his body is losing weight very quickly. Baron is shocked, the magician always knows what is going on, although the prince himself never complains about anything. He calmly asks, you have the power of blessing, right? Baron confirms, it grants the ability to heal and commitment to magic. Let the first of them, as it seems, has disappeared somewhere recently. The prince suggests that the source of his problems may be in the heart. Ellen asks if the prince finds the combination strange. 
namely healing abilities and magic. I thought the power of blessing strengthened my heart, says Baron. After all, both mana and life come from the heart. The magician confirms that the blessing strengthens the heart, but the prince didn't lose it. And his heart is in relative order, and his mana isn't blocked. So what's the matter? Asks Baron in genuine amazement. The magician suggests that the Kasphanian blessing has not disappeared, but is being used entirely elsewhere. It is affected by something to the point that it is unable to heal even minor wounds. Baron can't believe what he's hearing. Is this some kind of poison? Baron hits his leg with his fist. Was it poison? He screams. Ellen replies that if the prince didn't have the blessing, he would have died long ago. Neutralizing such a deadly poison was too much of a burden for the heart, and the healing ability was used to the maximum of its capabilities. In addition, Elorn continues, the prince tried to use mana, and the heart rejected it. Baron looks at the red bag that stands on the table. Kalyan was originally killed, but by the time Baron was inside the third prince's body, he was already being poisoned. Baron looks at the pearl-colored pill and realizes that something went wrong with the assassin. Why so? Why did they hang a boy who should have died of poison anyway? Baron wonders. Ellen looks at the angry prince in amazement. A fourteen-year-old boy can't be so bloodthirsty, he thinks. Who is he really? Baron, looking at the pill, suggests that it must be some kind of antidote. The magician confirms the hypothesis and says that he prepared it in a hurry, but it should still help. Twirling a mother of pearl ball in her hands, Baron analyzes new information for himself. What will happen if I take poison and antidote at the same time? Ellen is surprised by these words. He explains that in this case, the antidote can only slow down the effects of the poison. It turns out that Baron is quite happy with this. Are you sure about this? exclaims Ellen, sitting up from his chair. He then asks the prince if he has any suspicions about who is poisoning him. Baron says it appears that the poison is added to the tea he drinks every morning. He drinks it in full view of everyone, so it is very easy to control the poisoning process from the outside. Besides, no one drinks tea with him, and strangers can't get hurt. Perhaps, Kalyan noticed that something was wrong with his body, and refused to drink poison tea in the morning. Maybe that's why the villains had to hang him. Everything changed when I was in this body, Baron thinks to himself. But now it is not clear what method of eliminating him will be resorted to by his enemies. So, until I figure out exactly how they want to kill me, we have to keep it a secret, he tells Ellen. He clarifies whether this is the only reason. The prince replies that if he is really being poisoned with morning tea, then refusing it might endanger Yang and the other maids. The malefactor puts poison regularly and is sure of his impunity. Ellen is not sure that Baron's plan is correct. He says softly, the baby elephant will be fine. Baron asks again in amazement, but the magician says that he did not say anything important. Wearily clutching his head, he tells the prince that he still does not understand what he needs to do now. Baron recalls a conversation with his father that took place in his previous life. A wise parent had told him that if he wanted to get a trump card out of someone, he had to show his own first. Baron mentally thanks his father, who comes to the rescue just in such difficult moments. He asks Ellen to accompany him on his walk outside the palace tomorrow night. The sun is shining brightly over the magnificent royal palace. There are shouts from inside as someone asks Prince Planchet to wake up immediately, for the reason that Her Majesty is approaching the bedroom. The heir to the throne, to the despair of the servant, does not have time to get out of bed. Celis is already in his bedroom. She pulls back the bed curtain. It seems that he will not have time to clean himself up for the events scheduled for the day, the queen says with displeasure. And then she realizes that the prince was drinking before going to bed. She shouts in bewilderment to her son why he smells like alcohol. How drunk you were. You were forbidden to drink at the ceremony. Outraged Celis. Planchet reaches for a glass of water and wearily asks his mother why she has come. Just tell me what you need and leave, please, he asks her. Celis purses her lips in anger. She informs her son that Callian has apparently become an apprentice to a seventh-level magician, Ellen Manassel, and that the aristocrats are already worried about it. So what? Planchet asks indifferently. Celis's eyes bulge and she looms over her son. Shaking her folded fan in front of his face, she reminds him that she has invested too much in it and will not tolerate it if all her efforts are wasted. She orders him to pack up immediately. There would be too many eyes watching him today, and he must not disappoint his mother. She turns angrily and goes to the bedroom door, where the servants bow low in deference. Planchet is furious. He staggers out of bed and walks to the center of his bedroom. The servants cry out in fright. He has just cut his leg on the shards of a broken glass. He drives them away. The rage he feels is beyond words. Kalyan, the face of the third prince Kyrus pops up in front of his eyes. How he hated it. 
King Ramain rides down the main street of Kairos, accompanied by mounted guards. A large crowd gathered to watch the celebrations in honor of his birthday, enthusiastically welcomes the monarch. They praise him, wish him many years of life. The queen looks out of the carriage window. Princes Randall and Planchet ride beside their father. Enthusiastic onlookers point their fingers after them. They are immensely happy to see the future generation of their rulers. Behind them, Prince Callion rides on Raven. Next to him, at his own pace, is Ciron he leads the prince's horse by the bridle. At one point, he turns to the prince. He wants to know how Callion is feeling. In the morning, it seemed that he looked better than usual. Baron thanks Ciron for his attention, and then says that the external freshness is most likely due to the fact that he managed to have a good rest. Inwardly, he thanks the antidote. It really has made his breathing much easier. The pain in my heart also became noticeably weaker. But today's activities promise to be very tiring. After the parade, there will be a horse race, and then a ball. He tells Shiron about this, and Shiron expresses his fear that the prince will become ill again. Baron calms Shiron down, whom she still thinks of as a servant named Ian. I'll take it easy, he says, but suddenly stops in mid-sentence. Somewhere in the middle of the crowd, he spots a painfully familiar figure. He can't believe his eyes. This is the person from his previous life. He urged his highness Baron to raise his sword again. Yes, that's him the prince looks in shock at the face noticed in the crowd. Kiri, it's definitely him. Raven's starting to act weird, too. But what is Kiri doing in Kairos? Thinks Baron to himself. The horse begins to kick its hoof on the paving stones. What's the matter with him? Go, Raven. Saroyan, who is holding the horse's bridle, tries to calm the animal down. Baron tries to help Saroyan with verbal commands. Had the horse also noticed something strange in the crowd? Baron is very surprised by what is happening. He strokes the horse's mane. You felt it too, didn't you? He asks Raven. But right now, going out there into the crowd to find out what was going on would be very inappropriate. Just wait, Kiri. The third prince thinks. I'll find you. A young man with a thin mustache runs up to the king and says that it is a great honor for him to serve him. This is Melfir Pollen, owner of the Pollen Trading House. He informs the monarch that Ramain will surely like the performance he has prepared. So this is Baron Melfir, who was assigned to organize the races instead of representatives of the Bryson family, the third prince thinks to himself. I recall that this choice provoked the queen's violent indignation. All this, of course, is already unimportant. But if Baron's memory of his previous life is correct. During the race that the king and Melfir are now talking about, Randall was injured. Baron Pollen was hanged as a result. Melfir invites a delegation of royal family members to follow her. A delegation consisting of the king. Queen and three princes follows the baron. Baron looks up at the ceiling, where massive candelabra hang from it. I think it's this one that's going to fall, Baron recalls, his eyes lingering on one of the lamps. It's very strange. During an event that the king himself attends, all potentially dangerous objects like this must be checked by specially assigned knights for this task. And they serve in the Knights of Pable Corps, which is controlled by the Bryson family. Baron recalls the disgusting behavior of Pable, the commander of this unit, during their last meeting. The prince thinks about it. Maybe I should try to save Melvir, he thinks. With a happy expression on his face, he continues to lead the royal family in the direction he knows best. Baron approaches the baron without anyone noticing, and he whispers that he is very worried about the candelabra hanging over everyone's heads. The third prince advises to check how securely they are held in their places. Melvir Pollen is shaken to the core. He looks at the lights with concern. What could be wrong with them? In the circular arena, in front of the eyes of many spectators, four horsemen gallop. The crowd cheers loudly for the riders. The day has finally come when I sit next to the king, the man thinks to himself as he nervously clenches his fist. This is Melfir Pollen, to whom what is happening still seems like some kind of fairy tale. He feels like he can't pass up the opportunity, which was presented to him at this point in time. He glances at Baron, who is sitting nearby. He calmly watches the riders. Above my head, Melfir thinks. Ceiling. Did I check it out? Melfir Pollen looks down at the rope in his hands, his eyes filled with cold sweat and horror. Only a thin strand of hair remained intact, exactly in the middle, meaning that one was actually ready to break off at any moment. If it wasn't for the advice Prince Callion gave, Melfir thinks, things might have gone wrong. Exactly under this candelabra, the first Prince Randall is currently sitting. Melfir's legs give way as he imagines what the consequences of all this might have been for him. But, how could Prince Callion even know about the rope's defect? Baron is sitting in a luxurious chair with a completely calm look. He, in turn, is also thinking about Melfair. It is a great honor for him to sit next to the king. But he declined it to check Baron's warning. He seems to be a very sensible character. 
He, in particular, understands that sometimes it is better to grasp not for immediate benefits, but to think for the future. But why would the Bryson family use their knights to frame him, especially at this price? Baron looks cautiously at his half-brother, Planchet. He looks thoughtfully off into the distance. He doesn't know his place, he says. Below, a bald but bearded entertainer addresses the audience. Okay, calm down, please. It's not over yet. Now you will see the highlight of our program. Planchet, meanwhile, continues to talk. It's so disgusting that you want to throw up. He has this pitiful, disgusting, dirty blood. He looks at what he thinks is Callian. Hearing these words, the audience turns their heads in Planchet's direction. The king looks sternly at his second son. Baron clutches his face and sighs heavily. Pitiful and dirty blood. Planchet, I do not know what you are planning, but I might need you at some point. He thinks to himself. Well, Sellies, will you be disgraced for a long time? Thinks the king, who, by the way, keeps the most impassive expression on his face. The queen hides her face with a fan. How many times can I warn you? The queen grins and chews on her fan. She is confused by the expression on her son's face. He doesn't seem at all concerned about what just happened. The queen suddenly realizes that Planchet did this on purpose. But why? And why today? Those close to the royal family who are nearby are whispering animatedly. The second prince is behaving completely inappropriately. How dare he say such disgusting things in front of King Rame? We need to stop supporting this young boy. If Ellen Manassel is behind Prince Count, maybe it makes sense to consider him a worthy contender for the crown. I can't stand it any longer. You need to make a decision. The show is over. Rundell was not affected by the tragic incident, and Ramain did not show any particular reaction to Planchet's outburst. Baron analyzes what happened. Queen Selys was too quiet for a man who ordered someone to try to frame Malfair. Maybe it wasn't her doing at all. Another memory from his previous life comes back to Baron. He was playing chess with his brother at the time, and they had a conversation about what had happened in Kairos. Baron's brother asked him if this was really a planned terrorist attack on members of the royal family. He then replied that he couldn't think of any other explanation and asked his brother to provide his own. He laughed and said that it would be very funny if he revealed someone's cunning plot in a casual conversation. Then they decided to make a bet on the correctness of their guesses. And they laughed for a long time remembering who owed whom how much based on the results of all previous disputes of this kind. At one point, my brother told Baron exactly what he thought was suspicious about this case. Everything about him seems to be on the surface. The criminal is just about ready to be caught for assaulting members of the royal family. Baron's thoughts drift back to the present. From the death of the second most influential oligarch, Kairos will benefit most of all. The first, which is obviously Renan Bryson, owner of the largest trading company in Kairos. And, Baron asks Jan what important businesses Pollen's trading empire has. Most likely a diamond mine, the answer is. Well, if Pollen disappears, the Bryson Empire will take over the diamond business all very logical. Very clever, Renan, Baron mentally praises the scoundrel. I just wanted to save Pollen to see which way the situation would turn. But now I'll get paid for saving his life. Baron asks Jan to cancel all his plans for the rest of the day. She is completely perplexed. Most of the local nobility will be at the planned ball. The prince pretends that the words that he recently heard shocked him to the core, so he won't be able to attend the ball. It's getting late. The sun is slowly sinking behind the royal palace. Two cups of tea on the table. On a red sofa at a table sits the king in an elegant white uniform. He is deep in deep thought. What's going on around him anyway? Ramain remembers Ellen saying that the king would lose everything if he remained a bystander. And Planchet's disgusting words about Callian's pitiful, filthy blood. And the dying sighs of the third prince's mother. As she lay on her deathbed, she clung tightly to Ramain's arm and begged him to take care of their son. Suddenly the chamberlain comes through the door. He announces the arrival of the queen. Selys walks into the hall and stops at the table. The maid announces that she will bring tea and begins to clear away the cups that are already on the table. Has anyone been here yet? Thinks Selys. She was not aware of the king's meeting at this time. No need for tea, says Ramain. She'll be gone soon. The queen is shocked by these words. The king goes on as if nothing has happened. So, Selys, what brings you here? So, Selys, what brings you here? The king asks. She wants to talk about the incident that happened today. What if the Bryson family took responsibility for him? The queen glares at her husband. Planchet's outburst had unsettled her. Does this mean that the main thing for her is the position of Planchet? The king muses. But Selys is still as arrogant as ever, he notes to himself. Making a cute face, the queen says that she really enjoyed today's performance. And he suggests that the king reward Pollen, who organized it, in some way. If you say that, it means you're up to something, says Ramain. 
Why don't we give him the exclusive rights of the Brysons to supply horses to the royal court and run the stables? Her face breaks into a smile. The king flinches at the words. Is she willing to part with such valuable assets? It's exactly as Ellen said. Ramin recalls a conversation that took place a couple of dozen minutes ago. Man had warned that Selys would not part with the royal guard office because of the incident. She's still not too desperate. This map is too big, but it will still offer a decent compensation. Ellen also advised the king to pretend that he knew what his wife was planning. I wonder if Ellen thought of all this himself, or had Callian suggested it to him. For tonight's ball, he says grandly, Planchet will come in with me. Selly's eyes light up with delight. He'll be happy, she says. Last night, His Majesty King Rame and the second prince Planchet enter the palace. Together, just the two of us. As a reward for a well-organized performance, Baron Pollen received exclusive rights to manage the royal stable and supply them with horses. Everyone knows that this is the result of an agreement between Ramain and Selys after the prank that Planchet did. The nobles and courtiers clap their hands, but their thoughts are not good at all. I can only think of the sacrifices the Brysons are willing to make. What Planchet had blurted out yesterday could not go unpunished. This means that Selys will start to see Callian as a threat. It seems like the time has come to reassess her allies. Well, well, thinks Baron. In front of him is a veritable mountain of gift boxes. Prince, what should I do with all this? Asks Ian, Akka Saroyan, puzzled. He reflects, looking into the boxes. The fact that the influence of Planchet and Brisson, melting, cannot but rejoice. I don't want any who are ready to switch sides at any moment, he tells his maid. Send all the boxes except the two that Baron Pollen sent to the Mage Association. It also asks you to check the senders of several more boxes. It turns out that they are also from Baron Pollen. What is it? Asks the prince. A magnificent necklace with a pendant in the form of a huge red ruby. Those present can't believe their eyes. It's for the horse. He couldn't have sent this for me, Baron says, puzzled. What did you tell him? He asks Jan. She replies that Melfair asked about his preferences, and she said that the prince appreciates Raven very much. It's just wonderful, Baron says admiringly. My Raven gets a necklace that his master can only dream of. Baron understands. That Mephir is trying to verify the prince's intentions. If the gift is accepted, then the Baron will probably send you another one to thank you for saving your life. Do you know, Baron, what the true price of your life is? You can't get away with jewelry here. He asks Young to ask Pollen's trading company for the price of the necklace. After that, I must say that the prince liked it and he wants to buy it. Instead of just taking it, the prince wants to buy it. Jan doesn't understand what Baron is up to. Although, according to her, it will be an interesting task. Of course, yes, says the prince. But the main prize for the main interesting of the last day, he would have given another gift. He points to a strange purple flower, its petals studded with teeth. Ian looks at the label attached to the pot and says it's a gift from the Association of Magicians. Baron knows that magicians are connoisseurs of beauty, so he wonders what caused the choice of such a strange flower. However, Ian quickly finds an explanation for this mystery. If you believe the attached description, after death, the plant scatters pollen glowing in the dark, and some people like this sight like hell. Baron realizes that he can use this flower for something. His eyes light up. When asked if this gift should be sent back to the association, he asks to keep it. The prince really had a good idea. During the morning tea party, he allegedly accidentally spills tea. Jan runs up to him, takes his hand, and asks with horror in his eyes if the prince has been burned. Baron says he's all right, but the tea is spilled everywhere. Even the teapot had somehow turned over. Jan orders the maids to quickly clean up the prince's chambers. The overturned cup is lying next to the toothy flower. It is clear that its contents spilled directly on him. Jan fears that the valuable gift will suffer from such a careless attitude, but the prince assures her that nothing will be so terrible with it. The flower really tolerates being doused with tea. Baron concludes that there is no poison in the drink. He asks to leave the plant in his room, because he had already fallen in love with it. So, Selys, what brings you here? The king asks. She wants to talk about the incident that happened today. What if the Bryson family took responsibility for him? The queen glares at her husband. Planchet's outburst had unsettled her. Does this mean that the main thing for her is the position of Planchet? The king muses. But Selys is still as arrogant as ever, he notes to himself. Making a cute face, the queen says that she really enjoyed today's performance. And he suggests that the king reward Pollen, who organized it, in some way. If you say that, it means you're up to something, says Ramin. Why don't we give him the exclusive rights of the Brysons to supply horses to the royal court and run the stables? Her face breaks into a smile. The king flinches at the words. Is she willing to part with such valuable assets? It's exactly as Ellen said. 
Ramin recalls a conversation that took place a couple of dozen minutes ago. Man had warned that Celis would not part with the Royal Guard office because of the incident. She's still not too desperate. This map is too big, but it will still offer a decent compensation. Ellen also advised the king to pretend that he knew what his wife was planning. I wonder if Ellen thought of all this himself, or had Callian suggested it to him. For tonight's ball, he says grandly, Planchet will come in with me. Sully's eyes light up with delight. He'll be happy, she says. Last night, His Majesty King Romain and the second Prince Planchet enter the palace. Together, just the two of us. As a reward for a well-organized performance, Baron Pollen received exclusive rights to manage the royal stables and supply them with horses. Everyone knows that this is the result of an agreement between Romain and Sully's after the prank that Planchet did. The nobles and courtiers clap their hands, but their thoughts are not good at all. I can only think of the sacrifices the Brysons are willing to make. What Planchet had blurted out yesterday could not go unpunished. This means that Sellys will start to see Callian as a threat. It seems like the time has come to reassess her allies. Well, wow, thinks Baron. In front of him is a veritable mountain of gift boxes. Prince, what should I do with all this? Asks Ian, Akasaroyan, puzzled. He reflects, looking into the boxes, the fact that the influence of Planchet and Brisson, melting, cannot but rejoice. I don't want any who are ready to switch sides at any moment, he tells his maid. Send all the boxes except the two that Baron Pollen sent to the Mage Association. It also asks you to check the senders of several more boxes. It turns out that they are also from Baron Pollen. What is it? Asks the prince. A magnificent necklace with a pendant in the form of a huge red ruby. Those present can't believe their eyes. It's for the horse. He couldn't have sent this for me, Baron says, puzzled. What did you tell him? He asks Jan. She replies that Melfer asked about his preferences, and she said that the prince appreciates Raven very much. It's just wonderful, Baron says admiringly, my Raven gets a necklace that his master can only dream of. Baron understands that Mephir is trying to verify the prince's intentions. If the gift is accepted, then the Baron will probably send you another one to thank you for saving your life. Do you know, Baron, what the true price of your life is? You can't get away with jewelry here. He asks Young to ask Pollen's trading company for the price of the necklace. After that, I must say that the prince liked it and he wants to buy it. Instead of just taking it, the prince wants to buy it. Jan doesn't understand what Baron is up to. Although, according to her, it will be an interesting task. Of course, yes, says the prince. But the main prize for the main interesting of the last day, he would have given another gift. He points to a strange purple flower, its petals studded with teeth. Ian looks at the label attached to the pot and says it's a gift from the Association of Magicians. Baron knows that magicians are connoisseurs of beauty, so he wonders what caused the choice of such a strange flower. However, Ian quickly finds an explanation for this mystery. If you believe the attached description, after death, the plant scatters pollen glowing in the dark, and some people like this sight like hell. Baron realizes that he can use this flower for something. His eyes light up. When asked if this gift should be sent back to the association, he asks to keep it. The prince really had a good idea. During the morning tea party, he allegedly accidentally spills tea. Jan runs up to him, takes his hand, and asks with horror in his eyes if the prince has been burned. Baron says he's all right, but the tea is spilled everywhere. Even the teapot had somehow turned over. Jan orders the maids to quickly clean up the prince's chambers. The overturned cup is lying next to the toothy flower, it is clear that its contents spilled directly on him. Jan fears that the valuable gift will suffer from such a careless attitude, but the prince assures her that nothing will be so terrible with it. The flower really tolerates being doused with tea. Baron concludes that there is no poison in the drink. He asks to leave the plant in his room, because he had already fallen in love with it. Two horsemen ride slowly through the deserted night square of Kyrases. Baron thanks Ellen for making time for this walk in his busy schedule. The magician replies that he simply could not refuse the prince, his wonderful student. Moreover, he himself risks his life in this particular case. Baron smiles happily, and Ellen notices that the prince looks much happier than he did in the palace. Of course, I've been waiting for this moment, Baron says, breaking off strangely. He thinks to himself that he should be more careful with his words, he just almost said I've been wanting to get out of the palace for the first time. But he was Callian now, not Baron, never forget that. Are you sure you got the king's permission for this trip? Asks Ellen. Smiling, the prince replies that Romain should read his petition any minute. The mage doesn't seem surprised by the prince's impudence. He tells him that he, too, had a hand in her appearance at the prince's. Baron remembers the look on Jan's face when he urged Raven into a gallop and shouted that he would be back by dawn. She desperately reminded him that the deal was made before midnight. This is my student, Ellen says with a smile. Baron replies that he will take this as a compliment. After an exchange of pleasantries, the mage asks the prince if he is taking the antidote. He smiles and says that he drank it today. 
and it starts to feel much better than before, to the point where the poisoner starts to panic. The puzzle pieces will add up when the takes the bait. What exactly it is is hinted at by the toothy flower presented by the Association of Magicians, we see that it still died. Your ingenuity can only be envied. I'm starting to think you don't really need me, Ellen says, smiling. The prince replies that this is not true. He wouldn't have been able to do anything at all if it wasn't for the interesting gift that the mage sent. The writers stop. The magician says that he will leave the prince at this intersection. He thinks that he should accompany his student, but if the student feels that he should go alone, let him do as he sees fit. Baron pulls up his hood and says, grinning, I knew you'd understand. Ellen replies that there is a mysterious enclave nearby on Tain Edge Street. The prince can find him there when he's done with his business. Baron replies that he will call there and wishes good luck to both himself and the magician. The characters go in different directions. The hammer lands on the anvil with a deafening clang. A muscular blacksmith is forging some kind of weapon. It becomes clear that it is a dagger, Baron's red eyes are reflected in it. The prince likes him. He will be satisfied with them until the weapons that are made according to his special order are ready. Now it remains to do the last thing. Get information. Sekrisha has set up a spy network all over the continent. It allows you to get information about what is happening in other countries. But spies don't just collect data. Each of these years, people are trained for many years in the most thorough way, as an elite assassin. And the people who created this network of killers are none other than Baron's father, King Debul. And Baron himself, in his previous incarnation, of course. The prince's hooded face looks tense. He leads Raven down a narrow street, following two men who seem to be friends who have gotten drunk somewhere, holding on to each other. We see a sign with a bird sitting on a branch. This is the bird shop carrier pigeon on Narancha Street. Baron knows how dangerous Sekrish's hitmen can be. He trained them himself. There is another danger. Baron covers his face with a hood so that the drunken couple can't see his face. He is now a prince of Kyrus. If the Secretians found out that he was near their base of operations, they'll try to take him hostage, or worse. The black hair and red eyes look too suspicious. So Baron really had better hide them from outsiders. He enters the shop, and the bell hanging over the door announces his arrival. The shop is filled with the sound of birds singing and calling, and the birds are flapping their wings loudly. The place is much larger than Baron thought. Do you need a pigeon? A man in a gray vest asks him. The prince says no. These birds haven't woken up yet, the vendor says, turning to face the customer. A monocle glitters in one of the man's eyes. Look how sleepy they are, he continues. Baron suggests that the birds may have been tired if they had just returned from a long flight. Apparently, they are just resting now. Hearing these words, the salesperson visibly stiffens. He turns his face away from Baron in silence. Why are you here? He asks. The prince replies that he wants to feed the birds. The seller says that he came to the right address. The problem is, he says, the man throws a sharp, sweeping blow, trying to hit Baron in the throat. However, the knife misses its target, it passes just a couple of centimeters from the third prince's neck. Dot 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 that I haven't sold birds lately, he finishes. I haven't sold any birds lately, says the salesman, who is holding a shiny knife. Baron looks at him from behind the blade of the weapon he knows perfectly well that this is not an ordinary fighter, and in Callian's body there is no way to deal with him. To defuse the situation, the prince agrees with the words of the opponent. You haven't sold any birds yet, because you've only recently arrived in the kingdom, he says with a smile. It should be understood that the interlocutors use a special verbal cipher. Here, the word bird means spy and feed means leak information. Secret agents hide their appearance even from their colleagues, in this case, the failure of one allows you to avoid revealing the rest of the network. In other words, whose bird are you? Me? No one will fail, even if Baron uses his father's name. To introduce myself as a secretion spy, I am one of the Nebelads, Baron says. The bird seller stares at him through his monocle in shock. The prince slowly moves the knife away from his face. It seems Kalyan has just become the first ever prince of Kairos to spy on his own kingdom with the help of a secret agent. He winks at the vendor and says he'd like some food. The young bird had just left the nest. Two secretions are going somewhere. There are knocks and pops. Baron follows the salesman through the archway and up the stairs. Then they find themselves in a tunnel that seems secreto Baron. A new acquaintance tells the prince that since he is here not so long ago, they will have to meet quite often and suggests calling him White Hawk. The latter, without hesitation, introduces himself as a red swan in response. Looking askance at the prince, the interlocutor promises to remember this bright nickname. The door creaks open, and the prince and his guide enter a sort of library. So what kind of food do you need? The secret agent asks. One item and some information, Baron replies. White Hawk says that you will have to pay eight florins for this. Advance payment. But he doesn't even know what information I need Baron's astonishment is boundless. It seems to him that they are trying to confuse him with this nonsense. 
the interlocutor dispels his doubts, stating that they have a standard tariff here. Here, one item, one piece of information, your food. The bird seller puts a purse and a paper scroll tied with a thin ribbon on the table. Baron unfolds the last one, looks at it, and thoughtfully asks if the other is sure that this is the right place. The user replies that only it fits the specified description. The prince thanks his new acquaintance for his help. Take care of yourself, he says to him in parting. Baron pauses for a moment. This isn't the safest place, the secret agent explains, narrowing his eyes. That's for sure, Baron replies. But, White Hawk, it is unlikely that there will be anyone more dangerous than you. Baron, sitting on a horse, drives up to the bridge, in front of which a dozen people in monk's robes are standing. What are they doing here in the dead of night? The prince wonders. According to the map he just received, he should be crossing this bridge. Well, we should try to do it quietly, without attracting attention. But no one is going to let Baron pass, they block his way in the most brazen way. The prince naturally expresses his displeasure about this. They apologize to him. Baron learns that here and now the dead are going on their last journey, and it is necessary to wait just a little bit so as not to interfere with them. Baron notices that beautiful wreaths are floating on the river, in the middle of which are lit candles. It's a farewell ceremony, he realizes. He agrees to wait, disturbing the dead on their last journey would be completely immoral. The audience thanks the prince for this decision. Each nation has its own rituals of saying goodbye to the dead. The Kyrians believe that their souls leave our world on red flowers floating down the river, passing under bridges, and disappearing into the misty distance. In Sekrisha, in Baron's homeland, it is customary to decorate graves with the flowers of a local plant, the petals of which gently tremble in the wind and look incredibly touching during sunset. In its rays, they appear purple. The change of color reminds you that the living and the dead, like day and night, are forever separated from each other. This ritual allows Secretians to come to terms with their loss and let their loved ones go forever. Glowing wreaths float along the river under the bridge. This is a stunningly beautiful and incredibly touching sight. Baron looks thoughtfully into the distance. His brother. He placed a flower over his grave. Or was he able to use Arcus Tempest shortly before? Possible. Baron's red eyes glow, reflecting the light of the candles floating on the river. I am just a lost soul that has lost its way. One of the monks thanks Baron for his patience and respect for the dead. You can go now, sir, he adds. The prince is lost in thought. Whatever happened before, I am now the third prince of Kyrus, he thinks. Easy ride to your dead, he says to the person who turns to him. May their souls rest. The other man looks at Baron intently from under his hood. He gets on his horse and quickly rushes across the bridge. The monk looks after him. Hey, let's roll up. Do you hear that? One of his comrades asks him. No reaction. What's the matter with you? The caller asks. Nothing. In the memory of this person, a terrible but very sublime picture pops up. He stands over a dying enemy. One of his hands was cut off, but he continued to fight with the other until the last moment. I am Arson, Supreme Master of Valkenum, he had said. I will remember your bravery, Prince of Secretia. He seems like a good man, he says, looking after the retreating rider. On the way to the destination, Darren sees a lot of signs with the name Kisphanian. Deep sleep Kisphanian, rest Kisphanian, food Kisphanian, strong smell of Kisphanian alcohol. So the information that the agents sent to Baron in his previous life was correct. Kisphanian supporters are settling in the capital, Kyrases. He stands in front of a bald man with a goatee who promises to take him to an empty place. The prince refuses. He needs to go to the fourth floor of this two-story building. Hearing this, the bald man rolls his eyes in surprise, but he agrees to take the guest there. The fastest way. They stand in front of the door, and the bald man wishes the prince a good time. Baron walks through what looks like a typical dining room. He stops in front of a coat rack nailed to the wall. On the third hook in a row, he sees an object that resembles two pairs of butterfly wings lying on top of each other. He had received only one piece of information from White Hawk in the form of a paper scroll tied with string. It reported a place where illegal activity is concentrated in Kyrases. There and twirls the butterfly wings, and it achieves the desired result. A piece of the wall moves to the side, opening an opening where you can enter. Information about the presence of four floors in a two-story building indicates that. That here everything happens under, and not above the ground. To be more precise, in the basements. Information that Baron is looking for. Not related to card games. Where money just changes hands. In the depths, at the very bottom. Baron opens the door and looks inside. There is a hall where people desperately beat each other. Illegal fist fights are held here. The audience does not hide their emotions. Heated players loudly shout. Kill him. Knock out the bird. Yes, you dodge. Do you even know how much money I put on you? You beat like a woman. Do not think to give up. Get up, you 
Finally, the fight that provoked all these emotions ends. It follows the announcement that today the bloody Gerard has won again, a muscular monster, whose name has just been called, makes an inhuman roar, standing over the defeated opponent, who is unlikely to rise to his feet. Another ad, those who bet on white will receive the appropriate certificate. Two strong men lift the losing fighter by the arms and legs and carry him out of the ring. A red trail is left behind the lifeless body. The place smelled of blood. Tell them to arrange another fight. I didn't doubt Gerard's victory. He didn't hit him enough, he should have done more. Baron feels an unbearable loathing for all these moral freaks. Hey you, in the hood, come on, pay the entrance fee. One of the local security guards approaches Baron. Then he roughly calls a rather cute blonde, long-haired girl over and orders her to take the newcomer to number 27. The woman clutches a tray to her chest and looks at Baron in fright. She shakes her hands and points somewhere to the side. The prince understands that the girl is asking him to follow her. Is she mute? He thinks. After looking closely, the hero notices that his guide's ears are cut off. As he looks at her, he realizes that the clothes she's wearing are not something she would have willingly put on. The girl has a sort of tracking collar around her neck. It looks like she just can't physically escape from here. The girl points her finger at the tray with the number 27 on it. Baron guesses that she is offering him a bet. The hero understands that he must play until he gets what he came here for, takes out two coins and throws them on a tray divided in half into white and black halves. The rules that apply here are extremely primitive. We can say that they do not exist at all. You bet money, someone fights next to you. And if the person you bet on wins, you get exactly twice as much money. Three florins turns into six, and six into twelve. And so battle after battle. The announcement sounds, match ten is over. Pantalon won with an iron knee. The mute girl covers her mouth in fright. Those who bet on black will receive a certificate for exchange. Baron, the table in front of which is filled with piles of coins, makes another bet. That's how three florins turns into 1,536 florins, he says loudly. People look at him and whisper incomprehensibly. As for himself, he thinks that he came here not only for money. The announcement sounds, we have the last fight. This is a special battle for which dividends are paid fourfold. In the white corner is Sean Bloodfist, and today he is opposed by Invincible Boy. Baron screams in surprise. It's him. In his previous life, he had to earn a living by participating in fistfights. This continued until the death of his sister. We present today's candidate. The host shouts in a characteristic voice. Phrases from the past flash through Baron's mind. Kiri, do you want to become a knight? No, I want to become a sword. Your highness's sword, don't stop. The host continues, that's Kiri. Introducing today's contender, monster-eyed Kiri. The host of this evening shouts loudly. The fighter, whose hands are shackled, looks blankly into the distance. Baron puts the entire mountain of chips he has earned on the black half of the tray. All in black. He announces loudly. The mute girl looks at him with horrified eyes, large drops of sweat running down her face. He's gone mad. He decided to bet everything he earned on this runt. The audience loudly discusses the behavior of the lucky guy, who has never been seen here before. But looking at the prince's calm face, some people start to suspect that he knows something. The host starts talking about Kiri's performance statistics. 0% of wins, although the justification for the fighter is that he has not yet held a single fight. Will he be able to claim his first victory? Hey, that's a lot of money. Why don't you think about putting everything on the line? Comes a voice from the next table. A burly guy in a white t-shirt is sitting behind him. He advises you to think better of it, as Kiri's opponent seems to be a clear favorite in the upcoming fight. Little Kiri, according to him, hasn't won a single fight yet. Baron simply ignores the advisor. He asks the girl if she counted the chips, which he put on black. The guy at the next table doesn't let up. Anyway, don't say I didn't warn you when you lose everything you've won so hard before. Sean Bloodfist looks very formidable. It's a real mountain of muscle. The audience cheers loudly for him to get rid of Noonim. Some thugs are calling on him to kill Kiri. In general, the audience is out for blood. Kiri glances over her shoulder at Baron, whose chips are still being counted by the mute maid. The fighter can hear the comments of inveterate wagers, who are convinced that the lucky person who put all in on Kiri will lose everything they earn from minute to minute, and all because of their greed. Sean, standing in the opposite corner of the ring, also has no doubts about his easy victory. The host loudly announces that the main fight of the evening begins. The shackles in which the fighters were shackled fall to the floor. Sean, without thinking, he lunges at Kiri. He throws sweeping punches, which, fortunately, fly past the head of the debutant. Some of them break on the blocks that Kiri puts up. The Belgian, it seems, has a very difficult time. You're so slow, Sean teases as he puts his knees to work. A punch sends Kiri flying to the far end of the ring. The audience is raging, encouraging the She calls on him to kill the swam opponent. Kill him, someone shouts loudly. Baron slams his fist down on the table in anger. He's furious, Kiri doesn't seem to have much chance of fending off the beast without a sword. 
what are you doing, Kiri? Come on, turn it on, it's too big for you, he mentally encourages his friend. But he keeps missing shots, what only provokes the opponent. He continues to throw punches, trying to finally knock out this overly tenacious cockroach. Kiri's mouth is bleeding, and he's still taking heavy blows from his opponent. Shouting his name, Sean throws heavy punches. One, second, third, impudent, the hits with both hands at once. I'll kill you, he shouts. Kiri covers her face with her hands and just puts up with it. Baron jumps up and calls loudly for his friend. Don't expose your shoulders before the blow, he demands of him. Kiri seems to have heard the advice. Before impact, shoulders. Just before the next blow hits, he lowers his shoulder, and Sean's fist flies over him. Kiri crouches down and delivers a crushing blow to the solar plexus. It's a perfect hit. Baron's face lights up with happiness. Kiri's fist pierces through his abs. Sean screams in agony. But this is only the beginning of his opponent's attack. Now it's his turn to unleash a hail of punches on the enemy. The beating begins. Kiri hits Sean in the jaw and knocks out a tooth. Bent over from fatigue, he stands over the defeated opponent. This is a pure knockout. The audience screams in disbelief. The mute maidservant, who is still at Baron's side, is shocked to the core. This picture will be remembered by everyone present for the rest of their lives. This can't be happening. The host shouts in an inhuman voice. Monstrous-eyed Kiri defeated Shona, nicknamed Blood Fist. This is his first victory in our ring. But the audience doesn't share his enthusiasm. I lost everything I have because of you. While die, you the shouts that reach the fighter's ears clearly indicate how disappointed the audience is. Kiri, dropping drops of blood, blood flowing out of his mouth, looking for the person who told him how to act in battle. But Baron hides his eyes, although he feels indescribable joy. A man comes up behind him and tells him that someone wants to see Baron. Turning around, the prince sees a large bald man standing in front of him. Follow me, he says. Hairy fingers scrape the table. Their owner informs Baron, who is sitting on the sofa, that he has a real talent. No one has ever been able to turn three florins into six thousand florins in an evening. But there is something that makes this man uneasy, the hilt of a sword glitters behind the prince's back. He is not sure that he has the right to give such a large sum to a teenager. The owner of the hairy fingers turns out to be a young red-haired jock with a very impudent expression on his face. Baron smiles. I thought you were going to pretend to be trying to negotiate, he says, causing the other person to be perplexed. But you're more than you look, he continues. Flashing a gold tooth, the big guy asks why the kid sitting in front of him is so brazenly driving himself. Is there someone behind it? He demands that Baron remove his hood and show his face. The prince takes hold of the edge of the hood. But before putting it down, he warns that if he shows his face, the situation may become too fussy for the other person. The red-headed jock, he says, is ready for complications, especially since he has half a dozen well-trained henchmen with him. One of them looms over Baron. He says that he is ready to look at the dangerous face of the boy and reaches out to help him lower the hood. After a moment, his face contorts in pain as Baron thrusts his knife into his hand. A high-pitched scream is heard, and the wounded man's comrades realize that the promised trouble has already begun. What's wrong with you? It seemed to me that the only normal thing you have is. The boy's voice sounds rather ominous. The red-headed jock with the gold tooth is furious, they've managed to let a crazy into the place who uses a knife at the first opportunity. Look, it's just too much money to give away at once. But if you wait a bit, he begins to coax Baron. But the latter, twisting his weapon around his finger, declares that he does not need money. He wants to take monster-eyed Kiri instead. Red doesn't agree. This just started making him money and the owner will never agree to let him go. This is absurd, the scoundrel thinks. If I give this guy to Kiri, I'll get my head blown off. Is he out of his mind? No matter how good he is with his knife, he is here alone, and there are many of us. We'll crush him. Baron continues to play pointedly with the knife. I'm sorry, but I don't think we can give it to you, the redhead begins. A lightning lunge follows. The knife passes in front of his face and comes down. A moment later, the jock is already sitting on the floor with his pants cut open at the waist, from under which you can see pink underpants and a small white dumbbell. If I take both the 6,000 florins and your life, Baron says mockingly, will you think about starting a normal negotiation? White magic rays are streaming around his figure. Red, his eyes bulging with horror, screams loudly. It's an aura. He orders his companions to bring Kiri here immediately, and one of them immediately runs out of the room to do so. Baron knows he can't do this trick again. This body will not support such a load, but the matter must be brought to an end. The who ran out a little earlier returns, he tells the boss that he has encountered a problem. Kiri doesn't want to leave here without Hina. Baron shudders at the name. He is mentally transported to his past life and sees the face of Kiri, who says that his sister chose death for herself, and then he left the ring, since he couldn't forgive himself for not protecting her. The redhead is furious at his charges. Don't give a d 
about that sister bring everyone he wants. He yells, shaking his fists. I'll bring her myself, Baron says. All right, we'll do everything we can to make sure you leave safely, the redhead whispers, shaking with horror, his pliability clear. Just before that, playfully emitting a magical light. Baron leaned close to him and said in the darkest of tones that he wanted to collect both the entrance fee and the money he had won. The three of them walk slowly down the deserted pre-dawn street, Baron in front, next to Raven, and Kiri and Hina a little behind. A sister holds her brother's arm. She's still very scared. Thank you for helping us, Kiri says to Baron's back. He stops. But why are you helping us? The fighter released from captivity continues. Baron says Kiri would be better off putting aside her suspicion. He doesn't have any impure intentions. Brother and sister look at the hero who has turned to them. They realize that this is Prince Kallion. This is a real shock for young people. Kiri gets down on one knee as he apologizes to Baron for unknowingly daring to question his highness intentions. Don't lower your head to me, Baron asks him, and puts his hand on his shoulder. You don't need to do that, the prince says. Before him are the descendants of half-elves, for whom there is no one to stand up. It is quite obvious how difficult it was for them in life. In a previous life, when Kallian was still barren, Kiri ended up being unable to protect his younger sister. You have a bad habit of leaving your shoulder exposed during a fight. It is common for beginners who are just learning the art of war, Baron admonishes the young fighter. He asks if he wants to become a knight, and Kiri replies that it's not his main motive. He doesn't want to be a knight, but a sword that protects what needs to be protected. Very worthy, Baron thinks. You can't become a knight right now, he tells Kiri. But for now, you can serve as my shield. He hands him the sword and continues, but if you want to learn how to use a sword, find me, Kiri. The siblings still don't understand why the prince is being so kind to them. Kiri asks him why he is so generous. The prince looks at them kindly, because I need a good sword. He remembers a picture from the past, when Baron and Kiri were riding somewhere on a fine summer day. Here's what I can do, Kiri, to repay you. Kairos's, Tainancha Street, Association of Magicians, Ellen's office. The magician reads a newspaper article discussing how Prince Planchet insulted Freya. It also contains a story about how a magician who visited a horse show found out about it. What Prince Callion said to Melfir Pollen was literally this, I am very concerned about the candelabra hanging over my head, check it out. It goes on to describe that a worried Pollen checked the prince's words and found a sawn rope. Ellen is lost in thought. How could the prince know about this? Baron looks in the door. Teacher, I'm here, he says happily. Alan looks at him suspiciously. He asks the student what happened to him. He looks like he's been in a fight and half his clothes are gone. Baron happily replies that something has indeed happened. The magician speaks. That from the prince's appearance, it was clear that the business he was doing was quite complicated. Baron sinks wearily into a chair and confirms his teacher's suggestion. He's got Kiri on his side and he set up a trap for putting poison in his tea. Everything is going according to plan. But why is my heart so heavy? Muses Baron. Maybe because so much is happening in a very short period of time. Ellen looks at his student thoughtfully. With a wave of his hand, the teapot rises above the table and pours tea into the cups. I finally see that this is the magician's office, Baron says. Ellen replies disappointed, you what? Do you want to see eyeballs in jars or potions brewing in cauldrons? Baron describes his feelings. The room looks more normal than he expected. The only thing that bothers him is the dagger, which is lying on the table without a scabbard, it doesn't fit in with the local atmosphere at all. Suddenly Baron recognizes this weapon. He was holding it in his hands, and the blade reflected his red eyes. Ellen asks what the prince thinks this dagger is doing here. I don't think it should be here, says the mage, whose hands begin to emit reddish streams of magical energy. The dagger rises into the air, and it flies straight at Baron. There's no way to avoid it anymore. The weapon is already very close. Blood sprays everywhere. Ellen crosses his arms over his chest and watches the scene unfold. Even with such a weakened body, the prince managed to draw his dagger and deflect the projectile that was flying at him, and blood came out of his mouth. Ellen explains what happened. This is a magical weapon made by Kasfanian. It copies the weapon that the enemy has hidden. That is, in fact, it is something like a warning. Darren, a trickle of blood running from his mouth, considers this. Ellen didn't seem to be trying to hurt him. It was he who was impatient. He even activated his aura. It's a real failure. It's strange to see the aura around someone who claims to not even know how to handle a sword. Holding his dagger, Baron thinks about what to do next. Suddenly, he feels Ellen's hand on his shoulder. He begins to explain. Our first meeting was out of the ordinary, but I was able to explain it to myself logically. And then the oddities started piling up on top of each other. The king, for example, said that the prince is afraid of horses, and the nobles noticed that Kallian had become a completely different person. When you found out that you were being poisoned, you weren't afraid of death. A demonstrated bloodlust. Such energy can only come from a person who has shed a lot of blood with their own hands. Not to mention, what you knew about that. 
what will happen at the horse show and prevented the tragedy. Prince, you can explain all this to your teacher, Ellen says at the end of his speech. His hand is still on Baron's shoulder, and Baron can feel Ellen healing him with his magic. Someone who might not be anyone at all, muses the third prince. The mage seems to be doing everything he can to keep his faith in me. These feelings are impossible to betray. I'm not Callian, he says. I'm really Baron. Baron of Secrets. A new day begins behind Khan. Baron and Ellen are sitting in the mage's office, on opposite sides of a small round table. The time axis. You're deaf. Ellen tries to wrap his head around what he's just learned. So the real Callian is dead, he asks Baron. He thinks for a moment. I don't think so, he says. He didn't notice it at first, but now he feels the boy's presence inside him. Ellen looks at the student blankly and asks, During our first meeting, you said you weren't aiming for the royal throne. If that's really the case, may I ask you again? What are you really looking for? I want to prevent a war, Baron replies. I still don't know why Planchet needed the time axis. If you do not understand this motive, the problem will not go away. I feel like I should get to know him and make sure he's the one. Ellen asks thoughtfully that. What are you doing? Is it for yourself? Or for Chase, Wrath Baron? What do you mean? The prince asks. The magician says Baron must know something. There is only one crown prince in Secretia, Chase. His mother is the king's mistress, and the queen has no children of her own. The one called Baron. It doesn't exist in this world. Baron looks at the magician, shocked to the core. What? He asks. The man known as Baron of Secreti does not exist, Ellen reports. In this time, Baron is trying to figure out what this might mean. He's not from Secretia, nowhere at all, for that matter. But why? Because he jumped back in time. It seems that the time axis didn't work correctly. Maybe there was a space-time paradox. And that caused my soul to end up in Callian's body. Baron continues to ponder. Callian's body he raises his hand and begins to examine it. Callian was still alive. When was he inside? At first Baron thought that someone had possessed him just as he had possessed Callian's body. But now it is clear that this is not the case. The existence of Baron of Secrets is impossible if he is here, in this body, if only because the existence of two completely identical individuals is absolutely impossible. I should be blamed, too, Baron thinks, or rather, my arrival here. There are people who lost their lives because of it. Ellen stares at the third prince. In this time, he says, Chase has established himself as the heir to the Secretion throne. The future from which Baron came may no longer be relevant. In this case, it is no longer able to predict the future events of this reality. Baron is now only the third prince of Kairos whose life is in danger. There is no need to worry about the safety of the heir to the throne of Secretia. He still copes with this task perfectly on his own. Ellen stares at Baron, who doesn't seem to be able to come to his senses. You're saying I shouldn't let the past haunt me, he says suddenly. I know exactly what's bothering you, master, but I'll tell you what. Your concerns are groundless. The day I woke up in Callian's body here in Kairos, I vowed not to dwell on Baron's life. These words surprise Ellen. Now that everything has been revealed, the prince continues. Let me ask you, master, what about you? Can you accept the fact that I'm not the Callian the world knows? A very unexpected question, Ellen thinks to himself, but he is ready to answer it. Looking into Baron's eyes, he says, I have only one disciple, and this completely suits me. The prince looks happily at his teacher. Baron asks Ellen if he always knew about the time axis. They're already on a city street, heading somewhere on horseback. The prince noticed that the mage wasn't too surprised to hear about this artifact from his lips for the first time. Ellen's eyes look thoughtful. He says that last year, around this time of year, Prince Chase asked him for advice on the time axis. He then, observing the utmost secrecy, went to Secretia to study the artifact. But I only realized that it wasn't created by humans. And last month, the news came that the time axis was gone. Interesting, isn't it? He says, because you've been around this time for about a month. The time axis, Baron thinks, disappeared when I went back in time. What does this mean? I wonder if there's a reason I ended up here, he asks Ellen. Also, in his opinion, it would be nice to understand why the time axis disappeared. The wizard cuts him off with a wave of his hand. He says that all these questions are still unanswered, but he knows someone who can shed some light on what's going on. This man is much wiser than Ellen, and Baron must meet him very soon. This is a Kasphanian. Exactly. The third prince suddenly realizes. His coming-of-age ceremony is approaching. The Prince of Kairos, upon reaching a certain age, goes through an initiation ritual called Roslita. He travels to the now-empty Kisphanian nest, where he announces himself as the newest member of the royal family. There, in the dragon's den, he is granted an audience with the Kisphanian will. Holding up a finger, Ellen tells the student that until then, he just has to try not to die. That is, if there is such a possibility, as soon as possible to deal with the poisoner. Baron understands that this is the best course of action. The seeds that he had sown should have already sprung up. Baron stands in front of a toothy flower given by the mage association. 
Jan tells him that she is exhausted with excitement. The prince promised to be back by midnight, but turned up just before morning. That's what I thought, Baron muses, feeling the plant's leaf. He calls out to Jan, and she tries to guess what the prince wants maybe. Fill the tub, so that he can quickly clean himself up. Come here, you'll like it, he says. He leads Jan out onto the balcony. What's the matter, your highness? She asks, and offers to go inside. The prince is only wearing a thin shirt, and it's quite chilly outside. The flower given by the mage association is very rare. After its death, it scatters bioluminescent pollen. The prince deliberately spilled poison tea on him in front of everyone, to see the reaction of everyone in the bedroom. The poison used to poison tea is very dangerous and can kill the average person in just a week. The flower cannot withstand direct contact with this poison, but the plant that now stands in the room looks very fresh and healthy. It was as if someone had quietly replaced a dead flower with a new one, not believing my eyes. Jan sees a glowing path in the square in front of the palace. This, how magnificent. A wilted flower would be a convincing piece of evidence, and it couldn't just be thrown away. The attackers had to take him to a safe place. This means that on his trail you can find the one who is behind the poisoning. Where does the path lead? This palace is well known to all. Queen Selly's lives here. It's raining outside. Its drops fall on the lush green leaves of trees. Baron looks at this lovely picture, standing at the window of his bedroom. He hears that someone was approaching his chambers. It's Jan she brought the tea. Hi, Jan, did you sleep well? Asks Baron. He looks fresh and alert. Ian also asks how good the prince's sleep was. Then she says that it is a little unusual for her to hear the words that she usually says in this situation. Baron says that he really woke up earlier today. It's very unusual, Ian replies. Baron takes a cup of tea. Jan asks if the sound of rain woke up the prince. Baron sips his morning drink. It tastes a little different than usual. Sally's has increased the dose of poison, the prince guesses. He asks the maid if there are any events planned for this week where all the nobility of the kingdom will be present. It turns out that there is one, a conference that King Ramain himself will attend. Next week, thinks Baron, raising the cup of tea to his lips. After the conference, there will be a gala dinner. This is the perfect day to stop drinking this poison tea. Well, Sally's, an interesting surprise awaits you. In Baron's palm is a round pill. He brings it to his mouth and immediately swallows it. Ian takes the empty teacup from him and asks him what kind of balloons he's been swallowing for the past few days. Baron says they are vitamins he is supposedly trying to get rid of the weakness that he has been feeling lately. While tying up the pill bag, Baron says that he wouldn't mind going to breakfast earlier than usual. Ian promises to help him do this. Ian is holding a tray with the prince's empty cup. She examines it carefully. Something's wrong with the dream all this. After the incident that occurred at the festive horse show, Planchet stopped coming to breakfast with his brothers. This is even better for me, Baron thinks as he brings the food to his mouth. It would be very troublesome if the second prince ruined what he had planned. The roses will be blooming soon, he says to Prince Randolph, who is holding a glass of some red drink in his hand. He turns to Baron, but it doesn't say anything. Getting up from his seat, the first prince heads for the door, and passes through it, accompanied by a servant. Prince, why did you mention roses? Asks a dumbfounded Jan. Baron replies that he saw these flowers while walking, and they reminded me that Brother Rundell was a rose grower. There is no other background here. Baron, he staggers through the garden. He's breathing hard, big drops of sweat running down his face. He stops at a tree and leans against it, trying to catch his breath. Someone comes up and asks how it is that the prince's condition is getting worse every day, is he playing too much self-torture? If I'd missed my endurance training, it would have been really bad, Baron says, smiling. He sees Ellen standing in front of him and asks where he came from. The magician replies that he had a brief conversation with Romain. Baron points out that they must have become friends if Ellen calls the king by his first name familiarly. The magician refutes this assumption, he names the monarch behind his back, but has every right to do so, he is old enough to be his great-grandson. So why did you want to see the old man? He asks the prince. He answers that he wants to ask about two things. First, he wants to know the identities of two people. It will be easy, says Ellen. And secondly, Baron wants to investigate suspicious cases that seem to involve the local nobility, more specifically, the Brysons. Smiling, the magician replies that this is also not difficult, but his disciple is driving an old sick person to death at such a pace. Two requests at a time, he says. You must be in a hurry. Baron reports that she has increased the dosage of the poison. Ellen assumes that his student has a suspect and says that he suspects someone himself. Baron warns that she will soon reach Ellen. It would be very difficult for her to directly harm a great mage, but there wouldn't be much time for him to strengthen his influence. So you want to use me as a shield, Ellen realizes. No, like a weapon, the student declares with a glint in his red eyes. Yes, weapons. I know the true power of magicians better than anyone else, while many underestimate it. 
an army of white demons made up of mages. You took my life and my homeland. I, Baron clenches her fists. Baron says angrily that he wants to create a mage corps. Ellen is perplexed. He tells the student that mages are not knights. They do not acquire their skills and abilities as soldiers, that is, not through regular training. Let's just imagine, says the prince, that it's still possible. He recounts what happened in his previous life. When Ramain announced that he would create a mage corps, everyone was skeptical about this idea, including the Brysons. It seemed to them that this was nonsense, unworthy of attention, and thanks to this, Ramain was able to calmly do what he wanted. He completed his plan. But, after the mage corps was formed in the required form, the king died. Under very suspicious circumstances, the Magus Corps became subordinate to Planchet, who ascended the throne. The result of all this, Ellen sees now with his own eyes. But this time it won't be easy, Baron continues. Because the Bryson family will soon lose all influence, he thinks to himself. So I, he says aloud, want to use Sully's poison tea as an argument in negotiations. Ellen asks in disbelief. He asks Burn to tell him exactly what he's up to, but he just smiles slyly. It's a secret, he says, but I can only hint that it will happen very soon. Ellen grabs his head and ironically thanks the student for making this clear. Baron advises him to ask Romain's opinion, who apparently has a lot of thoughts on this matter. We must, Baron says, rubbing his elbow, use the mistake Sully's made, and succeed in negotiations. As you ordered, we have increased the dose, Burns made informs Queen Sully's. She slams her fist on the armrest of the chair and angrily says that you need to do everything right. She is very concerned about the news of the last few days. Will something even more unpleasant happen because of the maid? Sellys asks her. She promises to do everything exactly as she is ordered. But only another reproach is awarded from the queen. Someone approaches the gorgeous arch structure where this conversation is taking place. The one who should worry about everything the most doesn't do anything. So I have to suffer like this? Korleova continues to complain about her fate. Finally, Sellys notices someone approaching them. This is Planchet, who, as usual, could not properly button up his smart white shirt. That's exactly what I wanted to say, he says loudly. He must have heard the last part of the queen's conversation with the maid. No, Planchet, it's not up to you, who can't do anything, to decide, Sully says, sitting at a table with a full cup of tea on it. But what can I do? She says wearily. I feel like I'm destined to suffer in this life. Planchet clenches his fists in rage. Holding onto his coat, he pointedly turns on his heel and walks away. Weakling, Sally says, raising her cup to her lips. She then promises to remove all obstacles in her son's path. Day of entering the palace. Hina, standing by the window and humming a cheerful tune to herself, examines her outfit for going out. Kiri, who is holding a sword, notices that his sister is in a great mood today. Are you looking forward to it too? He asks her. The girl's face is filled with joyful anticipation. She will enter the palace today and meet the prince. She can't answer her brother's question with words, so she points out with her fingers that he guessed her feelings correctly. Kiri pats her head and asks if she doesn't like the prince. This is indeed the case, and Hina is looking forward to the evening when she can finally see him. Jan gathered around Burn. Three maids and Seth and Slake they dress him before the ceremony. The prince looks stunning in a brown shirt, vest and black jacket with gold patterns. Ian informs him that the noble conference is already over, and in about an hour, the third prince is due to arrive for a grand dinner in honor of the participants of this pretentious event. He calls her and says he wants to ask her to do something. Finally, it's time to put an end to this. Baron takes a decisive step towards the hall where the conference participants have already gathered. You can see from his face that he is very determined. Around the prince's neck glitters an elegant brooch with a large red ruby in the middle. Callion, the third prince of Kyrus, is announced. Queen Selys is already here, covering her face with her fan as usual. Baron gives her a very unkind look. This will be a turning point, after which everything will change. Horseshoes clatter on the city pavement. Jan, she's the same. As we know, Saroyan is jumping somewhere. She must deliver one to the Mage Association and the other to Alan. It's about the envelopes that the prince gave her. She wanted to go to the banquet with him, but he said he could handle the rest on his own. I told her not to worry. Ian is worried. But the prince had done something like this before. For example, when I cut my bangs, changing dramatically as a result. Ian tries to convince himself that there's no need to worry about him. The glass falls to the floor and shatters, spattering something red all around. The prince jumps up and looks at what is happening next to him. The queen rises from her seat, still covering her face with her fan. Yes, I'm sure. Callion, alias Baron, is lying dead on the floor, bleeding from his mouth. Association of Magicians. From behind a desk piled high with books and folders, someone speaks to the magician Manisle. Everything is prepared we see that the words are uttered by a young woman with purple hair. There are quite a lot of them, 
although I only collected official cases, she says. This is Aurea Saran, president of the Kairos Mage Association. But doesn't it seem suspicious that all of them are still unsolved? Continues Aurea. It is a fact that they could have been unraveled. Ellen, who Aurea is talking to, is looking at a document that suggests that nobles with little influence were simply not in a position to testify against the Bryson family. Aurea confirms these words otherwise they themselves would have become the subject of one of the mysterious cases. She wonders exactly how the prince plans to use all of these materials. Ellen continues reading. Suddenly, the door swings open and Ian bursts in. She is pleased to see that she has found both recipients of the letters delivered by Prince Callion here. She informs Alon and Aurea that she has brought them letters and gives them to them. The magician picks up one of the messages and begins to read it. This is for the president of the association, he says. Then he grabs his cloak and asks loudly, where the palace where the banquet is being held. Jan asks anxiously what's the matter, according to her, without an invitation, Ellen simply won't be allowed in the dining hall. But the man, making wild eyes, shouts that now is not the time to think about such trifles. The prince may die. Ian looks at the magician, startled. The note addressed to Ellen was short. Today, I will try to make a deal with Sellies at the cost of my life. If something goes wrong, please save me. An hour ago, there is a cup on the table, and a drink is being poured into it. It's just the two of us here, Baron says. His companion is Queen Sellies. The prince suggests that we speak frankly. The queen, removing her fan from her face, agrees. She folds it up and starts tapping it against her palm. I just wonder what it will change, she says, smiling. The fan clatters down on the table. Baron takes a sip of the tea that has been poured for him. He mockingly tells Sellies that he asked her to be honest. And not rude, completely forgetting about etiquette, as his interlocutor does. She says that she took the prince's request for a conversation with interest. But he seems to have decided to just arrange an incomprehensible squabble. Now she regrets it. The third prince is an ordinary cad, which is probably natural, considering how low a breed he is. I actually want to talk about poison tea, Baron says calmly. Sellies looks at him, startled. The prince announces the end of this circus. He's been patiently drinking the poison, but he can't take it anymore, disgust rising in his throat. Sellies pretends not to understand what he's talking about. Baron smiles slyly. He says that he expected this reaction from the queen, so he prepared in advance. Baron takes a small glass jar with white cubes out of the bag and shows it to the queen. Right now, I only have a strong heart, so my bet will be this, he says. This is a poison that quickly stops the heart. The queen stiffens. Baron received it from the white hawk. The poison does not react with silver and cannot be detected by magic tests. Naturally, since Baron has the blessing power, his heart won't stop. But it can only do one thing at a time. Therefore, by neutralizing the effects of this poison, it will no longer contain the poison that the prince conscientiously took every morning in the tea served to him. Baron asks Selys, still sipping from his cup, who will everyone think of first? Selys snorts at first. Then she starts laughing like a madwoman. Baron watches calmly as the queen rages. Do you think it's going to be your way? What is it? She asks. Do you think this is my first time doing this? Who doesn't know that I poisoned your mother? Selys' face is twisted with hatred. The prince looks down at the cup in his hand. So, what should I do with this tea? What is it? He asks, breaking into a wild smile. The queen advises to drink it as much as possible. Then I take it as a rejection, Baron says, and takes a sip of tea. He swallows poison. The queen smiles at this. She calls the prince an idiot, who, in his opinion, would even dare to voice their suspicions about her. If even Ramain himself is afraid of offending her with a careless word or action. In Kairos, I could get whatever I wanted including the queen's throne. All I had to do was get rid of the obstacles on the path I was following. That's how I got everything I wanted step by step. Except for just one thing. Selly stares through her full glass at the king making the toast. Its locations. The gala dinner is declared open. The prince, who is holding a glass, coughs and puts his hand to his mouth. The coughing gets worse, and from behind her fan, Selly's is happy to watch what she thinks is another enemy die. He's just become, thinks Selly's. The prince's cough turns bloody. He falls to the floor and stops showing signs of life. Randall, Planchet, and the king watch in horror. One of them tries in vain to reach him. Another step on the path of my ascent, the queen concludes. Someone frantically orders the priest to be summoned. While Selly smiles happily behind her fan, the third prince has followed her other victims. Those present call for security to be called, and there are loud suggestions that Callian is poisoned. People bend over the prince lying on the floor and try to bring him to his senses. He drank poison. That's impossible, even his majesty hasn't even taken a sip yet. Does that mean he was poisoned before this dinner? Both those present and the guards are trying to determine on the spot what happened to Prince Callion. Questions begin to be raised about who the young man was with before the event. 
S-H-H, if you value your life. So, prince, what a mess. Keep track of the words. People, some of whom know who the prince was with, whisper to each other, occasionally glancing at Selly standing in the middle of the hall. The queen may be pleased. Look at this, she thinks. None of them accused me. This is a complete triumph, once again. The king, coming out of a brief stupor, runs up to his son, loudly shouting his name. He sits down next to him on the floor, lifts him up and hugs him. Having ordered the priest to be called, he asks the prince not to come to his senses. He responds to this request and calls his father in a barely audible voice. The king is shaken to the core. This is an exact repeat of the death of the prince's mother. She, too, died in his arms, speaking his name almost inaudibly. She also begged them to protect their son. Just like Callian's now, blood was oozing out of her mouth. Father, says Callian again. The feelings that the king is currently experiencing cannot be described in words. Suddenly, he hears the queen's words. I can't believe this accident could have happened in the palace. I don't feel well, I can't stay here any longer. I'll go back to my home in Hesia. Rame, clutching the prince to him, angrily says through his teeth, so you decided to kill my son too. He shouts loudly as the queen walks away, ordering her to stop. Those present are instantly alarmed. It seems that something fateful is happening before their eyes for the kingdom. Celis turns around, waiting for her husband to tell her. People, meanwhile, are discussing the words he has already spoken. Yes, the two of them had come to the dining hall first, so she had already wanted to poison him back then. I think she really did it. Celis nervously clutches a folded fan. I have no idea what you're talking about, she says defensively. Callian, that boy, I've heard that he was always sickly. You said exactly the same thing, Romain replies, not hiding his rage, when Freya was dying. But then you gathered all the Bryson knights. Even your face is exactly the same now as it was back then. Romain, says Selys, even if you act like this, you shouldn't suspect me. The guy really wasn't healthy. No one will agree with your words. I remember now. The other princes met him every morning for breakfast. They need to know how bad Callian's health was. The queen offers to ask them, since both of them are standing next to each other. Romain tries to stop this fiery speech, but Celia does not let up. I'm acting like this because I'm worried. You've caused a panic, and because of that, Callian's. Our son's health could get even worse. How dare you call him? Our son, shouts Romain angrily. Planchet, who was silent before, decides to intervene in the squabble. When the queen sees that he is about to speak, she glares at him unkindly. The second prince, to her shock, declares that Callian was fine. Planchet never felt that his younger brother had any health problems. He even told him and Rundell not to worry about him. Angrily grinning behind her fan, the queen hisses at her son Piel. Un, she, a priest in a white robe appears in the hall he runs up to the prince and the king holding him in his arms. Selys angrily announces that he is returning to his palace. The king orders the priest to take care of the prince as soon as possible, using his divine power. But the other hand begins to act. Around the lifeless prince appears the already familiar reddish sphere, which literally repels the king and the priest. Startled, they turn their eyes to the source of this energy. This is Elo. You will kill him. He screams desperately. Why? You're going to kill him yells Ellen as he bursts into the dining hall. Sir Manessel, what are you doing here? The king asks, leaning over his son. The magician replies that Callian needs urgent treatment, but he has a circle on his heart. If this circle interacts with the sacred power, even in the best case scenario, his heart will explode. Then what do we Romain wants to ask something? But he stops when he hears his son's terrible cough. The prince is clutching at his throat, blood pouring from his mouth. But then it still asks, but what should we do if the sacred power doesn't work? Maybe magic can help. No, magic is powerless, we need a healer who has the power of nature, Ellen replies. Come up with something faster, the king asks. Can't you see that he's in pain? Ellen suddenly remembers something. His son's hand reaches out to him. On the floor is a bottle that spilled something red on the floor. A guy is kneeling in front of Ellen, blood pouring from his mouth, asking what's going on with him. This is so similar to what the magician is currently seeing in front of him. He lays Baron's head on his lap. The boy presses his hand to his cheek and calls his name in a barely audible voice. Teacher, why? Thinks Ellen. You have that look on your face. I never thought so. That I'll have to use this spell again. The magician remembers doing what he is talking about for the first time. He leaned over his son, wept, and cast a spell, after which powerful streams of magical energy enveloped the two of them. This magic will take away your pain. The magician casts a spell. Evening, lanterns are lit, people are walking and carriages are going through the streets of Kyrosis. Suddenly, flyers begin to fall on their heads. They are similar to handwritten ones, but there are a lot of them. People pick up these pages and read them. The moans that come to us from the graves. They are crying out for retribution for the Bryson family butchers who have 37 human lives on their conscience. The Brysons who sowed the wind reaped the storm. People who had heard that the queen had tried to poison Prince Callian, 
and who remembered the grim rumors about the family, took to the streets, with torches ready to burn and kill. This is a real riot. Shouts and isolated phrases can be heard from the crowd. Marquis Bryson, are these rumors true? You killed my father. We'd better disown the Brysons now, or they'll kill us, too. The king himself said that the queen is a poisoner. Who would have thought that Celes was a vile killer? Celes is not a queen. Banish Queen Celes. Prince Callion said that for the foundation of the Mage Corps, we should create a situation where Celes is forced to cling to the very end of the rope, Ellen says thoughtfully. He is alone with the king, who is holding some papers in his hand. Brahmane himself wanted to create a Mage Corps. Did Callion have the same plans as I did? The king thinks, not bad for a kid. The Mage Association, says Celes. How could she have prepared all this? The third prince, who is sitting across from her, replies that he has no idea what she means. He, by the way, had to leave for a long time after their last meeting. The queen, covering her evil grin with her fan, thinks that the prince looks very good, even though he was on the verge of life and death for about a week. Baron confirms this information by saying that he almost went to the other world, so he will not be able to talk to the queen for long. If she had nothing more to say, he would go to rest. The queen replies that she can offer a one-on-one -on -one exchange. This was relevant a week ago, Baron informs her, but a lot of water has flowed since then. But he would love to hear what she was willing to sacrifice. Celes decides to tell her about her original proposal if the prince declares that the materials incriminating her are not true, she will not interfere with the implementation of his plans. Baron snorts contemptuously, then he bursts out laughing. He says Celes doesn't seem to understand something. Him, you don't need permission from the queen, so she has to offer something different. Celes is lost in thought. Tell me what you want, she finally says. Baron grins, he wants a lot of things. How can the clash of swords be so loud in a land ruled by the Kisphanian heirs? This band the Knights of Pable Corps, he says. This, in his opinion, will knock out the support from under the feet of the Brysons. The queen screams with indignation. This corps was given to the queen by the Marquis of Brisson and serves as a counterweight to the king's guards. To lose it is to lose at least half of the power in the palace. Baron repeats his conditions clearly and clearly, disband the Pable Corps. The foundation of the Mage Corps. He doesn't agree to anything less. Celes glares at the prince, not hiding her anger, but she has nowhere to go. Baron calls Jan over. She presents the queen with a piece of paper. This is a vow that contains the seal of an elf. Celes reads the text of the document, and its meaning slowly dawns on her. Wait a minute, what is the seal of the elf? Stop it, she screams. This is the magic that burns the contents of the contract into the hearts of the signatories. And if someone breaks their vow, their heart will break. With a fatal outcome, of course. Celes looks at her torturer, filled with rage and shedding large tears. Queen Celes visited the third prince as soon as he woke up, says someone on Randalu's side. The prince nervously cuts a scarlet flower. He kneels down in front of the flower, holding an elaborate pair of scissors. Looking at the cut rose, he thinks. Very strange things are happening around him. Callian glanced at Randall before collapsing to the floor. Their eyes met. The roses will soon bloom, the first prince recalls his younger brother saying. It seems that he planned to involve him in the game from the very beginning. Randall was still wondering why the roses should bloom, so he decided to help him to do what he was hinting at. To say that his health was fine, but Planchet beat him to it. Randall cuts another full-blown rose. Something is definitely changing. Oath seal. Selly shouts in fright. Yes, Baron tells her, it is magic that burns the contents of the contract into the hearts of the signatories. And if someone breaks their vow, their heart will break. Rage seeds inside the queen. The prince mockingly says that the seal is necessary, as the trust in their relationship has yet to grow stronger. What are you going to do? She asks, not looking up from the table where the text of the newly signed contract is lying. This is the worst day of her life. She takes the pen to sign the paper from Jan with a contemptuous gesture. Selly signs the contract. Streams of magical energy rise from the pen. The queen's pretty face is disfigured with rage, she looks like some terrible monster. Celes raises her hand, which continues to glow brightly, and looks at this stunning special effect in disbelief. Baron praises the queen. Now from the heart are sealed with a vow. The contract is signed. The feather falls to the floor. And one more thing, says the prince after the departing queen. That day, Planchet didn't do it for me. If you'd just said something else, the king would have cut off your head right there. Celes remembers what Planchet looked like then. She pauses for a second. Then he raises his head resolutely and walks away with a firm step. The prince hears someone approaching his chambers. The footsteps are getting closer. I was told that Celes came to see you. I'm just in shock, Ellen says worriedly. The peel of another eaten banana flies to the table. Seeing the prince's appetite for eating these fruits one by one, the mage breaks into a smile. He seems very hungry. Baron says that bananas are incredibly delicious to him, and Ellen replies that this is not surprising at all, the prince miraculously survived, so he will find any food delicious. 
but I did what I wanted to do, Baron says happily, throwing another peel on the table in front of him. How do you even manage to smile, Ellen asks, just a little more, and he would have come not here, but to the cemetery. If the descendants of the elves hadn't arrived in the dining hall on time, this would have been the case. The prince is incredibly lucky that Hina, this innocent child, is a healer with the power of nature. Ellen repeats that the prince is very lucky, even he didn't know she was a healer. Did you find out about this in your previous life? The magician asks Baron. He replies that he should only know Kiri. Hina was already dead by the time they met. Ellen is shocked. He asks if this means that the prince took the poison, believing only in the power of the blessings, it was they who were supposed to save him. By claiming that you were tired of poison tea, the magician continues, you forced the queen to resort to another, more powerful poison. You've been drinking it for a whole week, without any countermeasures. What should I do in the future? Ellen is really angry, but Baron laughs merrily. He apologizes and hands him a banana. Ellen indignantly refuses and abruptly puts some papers in the prince's hand. These are the identity cards of the two young men you asked for, he says. Baron examines the documents with great excitement. He has already forgotten about his request, but asks the magician if it was difficult for him to fake them. Unexpectedly, he draws attention to the names of his wards Hina Baron, Kiri Baron. Ellen understands the reason for his surprise and declares that the documents needed a surname, so he indicated as such the name that the prince wore in his previous life. If only because Baron, in his opinion, deliberately found them in this reality and brought them closer to him. The hero continues to look at the papers. He sincerely thanks the magician for the service rendered. He notices that these are not fakes but real identity cards. It states that the siblings are commoners born in Kairos. He asks the magician how he managed to straighten out such reliable papers, and the magician replies that it was not he who did it, but none other than King Robin. Baron can't believe what he's hearing. The magician asks how the prince feels about the rumors that have spread that the king treats him as a beloved son and cares more about him than about others. Are there such rumors? Asks Baron. Naturally, after all, Ramain showed his feelings in front of all the nobles. How do I feel? The third prince says thoughtfully, probably the same thing that any other person would feel in this situation. Baron is sitting on a sofa in the bright sunlight of the room, his head resting thoughtfully on his hand. He calls Jan over and points to the banana peel, suggesting that it might be a good idea to remove it from the table. The maid calls him politely. Holding her hand to her chest, she walks over to him. I want to quit, she says hesitantly. Baron looks up at her in shock. A small child's foot on the carpet. The kid is running somewhere through a magnificent palace hall lined with thick columns. Back room in the right wing on the second floor. Having run where he wanted to go, the boy looks out from behind the wooden counter and loudly shouts that he is here. In front of him, a seriously ill man is lying on the bed, we can see his hand wrapped in bandages, clutching the blanket. Hello, brother, the boy shouts happily. Hi, Saroyan, the brother replies to the baby, sitting down on his bed for this purpose. Did you hear the cicadas calling this morning? The kid asks his brother happily. Cicadas? Yes. When summer starts, those nasty black bugs start yelling like crazy, the bedridden man says grimly. The boy looks at the world with much more optimism. He says that cicadas have very strange wings but they most likely make loud sounds inside themselves, with their stomachs. He suggests catching one of these insects tomorrow morning and bringing it here. My brother, who is wrapped in bandages from head to toe, says that he shouldn't do this, he doesn't like cicadas, they seem terrible to him. It would be better if the boy played the violin for him. His condition continues to worsen, the boy hears a snippet of conversation. I've heard that Sir Mayasal's son is quite good at medicine, the source tells his father. What do you think about? He said he was busy with something else, how can I ask him to do that? Snippets of phrases. Reaching the boy, very disturbing. But, sir, it really hurts me too, but there must be another way. I didn't know at the time. What about the phrase someone, who can't have and something they can't have? Siroyan. The brother calls the boy. Don't look away, look right into my eyes. Understand, I'm dying. They can have such a terrible meaning. The palace where the boy's brother is staying is ablaze. Wokrug and inside it, loud screams are heard. We must run. Take Saroyan and get him out of here. The fire is burning fast. That's how my brother, the day before he came of age, decided to put himself and everyone else out of their misery. After that day, summer passed and autumn came. It was replaced by winter, and then the cicadas started calling again in the garden. I was closing in on myself more and more. My father, who couldn't bear to watch me suffer anymore, took me out of the room I was always trying to lock myself in. Saroyan is sitting in his father's arms, his head resting on Togo's shoulder. What kind of boy is this? He asks suddenly. Ah, this? This is the third prince of our kingdom. The boy Saroyan noticed is sitting on the steps in front of the palace, his head bowed in his hands in grief. Red-eyed Kalyan is incredibly sad. Saroyan sees that the prince's heart is very heavy. I want to quit, Jan says timidly, looking at Baron. 
He looks up at her in shock. No, wait, what are you talking about? He asks. Jan, sobbing loudly, begins to tell the story. She was the person closest to the prince, but I didn't understand what was going on. Not only that, it was she who brought the poison tea to Callian every morning. The prince looks at his maid in surprise, and all because, Ian continues, she ignored everything that should have alarmed her. At that moment, when his life was in grave danger, she couldn't be there to help. He could have died, and she wouldn't even know why. Saroyan sees the face of his dead brother. Understand, I'm dying, he says, as if from the afterlife, and reaches for Saroyan with both hands. Jan, look at me quickly, the prince snaps out of these terrible memories. His face looks very menacing. Jan stares at him, eyes full of misery, tears streaming down her cheeks. The prince invites her to answer the question of who is standing in front of her right now. I can tell by the look in his eyes that he's waiting for an answer. Prince Callion, says Jan. Now listen, Baron shouts, taking care of me. With a hand on the maid's chest, I'm not going to die. Since the first time I opened my eyes here, you were there for me. And only thanks to you, I held out until this very moment. I survived because you took care of me. And whatever it is, I'm sure you'll continue to protect me. Is that so? The prince asks, putting his hands on Jan's shoulders. You're sobbing desperately, sobbing all over the place. Unexpectedly for Baron, she falls to her knees. Stop it now and get back on your feet, the prince shouts. Saroyan thinks, I don't think I can go back. The prince reaches out to help me to my feet. There's a person here, who I have to protect for the rest of my life. The prince lifts the sobbing girl from her lap. I'll deal with the who tried to kill you, Ian declares, getting to his feet. The prince looks thoughtful, as she begins to clear the banana peel from the table. Are you going to avenge me? The prince asks. Why not? The girl starts to worry again. They tried to kill you. Oh, stop it, Baron replies. Elephants, he says, should be quiet, and you, God forbid, will start a real war. These words shock Jen. Elephants, 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 did you know everything? She asks, looking startled. The prince begins to laugh, which can be considered an affirmative answer to the question. Throwing banana peels for many meters around, she shouts a good obscenity, from what time? The prince walks away from her, grinning, and shrugs his shoulders, saying that he doesn't remember anymore. Saroyan shouts that the prince could not have found out about the baby elephant by accident and guesses that he was communicating with his father, obnoxious old man. The prince mockingly says that as soon as the baby elephant throws away the peel, let him make him a cup of coffee. He also wants to argue with him about which of them will eventually grow bigger. The drop falls into the water, which begins to spread circles on the surface. Baron looks surprised. His predecessor, Callion, appears before him. They stand opposite each other on a background that looks very much like outer space. Callion seems at peace. Baron is afraid. Callion, who is wearing boots, takes a step towards Baron, who is barefoot. He comes up close, and he smiles brilliantly. Young people stand with their backs to each other. Baron, in a white shirt, looks away. Now there are three of them in the middle of the void. Saroyan joined Baron and Callion. Callion looks at his two companions. He has a very soulful face. Something scares Baron. His fist is pressed against his body. He opens it and holds out his hand. Callion ooh. The man looks him straight in the eye. Baron does not withdraw his outstretched hand, though he is clearly surprised by something. Callion's mouth falls open. Waves of white energy begin to flow around him. Baron understands that something wonderful is happening. Callion laughs. Baron reaches out to him, but he can't touch it. He is thrown away from Callion, who is standing still. The figure of the real third prince dissolves in the rays of white energy. Bedroom window, night outside. There, somewhere out, stretches the hand of a man lying in bed. It's Baron, and when he can't reach what he wants, he sits up in bed and looks out the window. So in the end, he's gone forever. A voice asks him, in front of us is a lighted candle inside a red flower. This is how the dead are seen off on their last journey in Kairos. Yes, Baron replies, and we see that the other person is Ellen. The prince thought that Callion would want to enjoy what he had been striving for for so long before he left. But he was in a hurry and just left. Baron looks thoughtfully into the distance and remembers again the red flower with the candle inside. This life, Callion told him, I'll give it to you. Baron then asked him what Callion himself wanted. With his index finger, the prince drew, a smiling face in the middle of the starry cosmos. Well, be like this, be sure to be. Closing his eyes, Baron tells Ellen that if this boy's life has been so miserable, he is a little jealous of his complete freedom. He won't pretend that he doesn't understand all of this. Baron started a lot of things. He owes a lot of people. The prince looks out into the bright distance. Then he lowers his head and closes his eyes, making some very important decision for himself. I... He says, we'll live my second life with dignity. A flower with a candle floats away into the distance and disappears inside the white light. 
the Pable Knight Corps was disbanded and its members returned to Marquis Bryson's disposal. Romain ordered not to believe baseless rumors about the royal family. Ellen Manessel has announced that he will create a mage corps, so that, three months later, Baron looks down at his hand, which has become too tight for him. Her buttons are about to fly off. The maids realize it's time to summon Seth and Slake. The tailor will probably have to alter the third prince's entire wardrobe. It's only unclear what he should wear now. Welcome, Callion, the king greets Baron. He says that his son seems to have grown noticeably since their last meeting. It even seems to have overtaken Planchet in height. Yes, and gained weight to the great joy of his father. The prince smiles and confirms that he has grown a little. The king asks if the prince has prepared for Roselight. Naturally, he replies, this is his coming-of-age ceremony. Ellen chimes in. He says he has to introduce someone to Baron, and that's exactly what they're here for today. This is a mage who will be the prince's guardian during the upcoming Roselight. Someone with blue hair is approaching. He says he is very happy to meet the prince. Meg, smiling happily, he says that his name is Arson Hertz. Baron looks at him in shock, he knows him from his previous life. The king says with some pride about Arson that this is a real talent who will be part of the mage corps. Romain expresses his hope that the prince will meet the magician and make friends with him. Talent, then, says Baron softly, quite unexpected, I must admit. Great birthday gift. When can we expect the official formation of the order? The cup clinks down on the saucer. Ellen, referring to the king, says that the organization has not even been named yet, so there is still a lot to do and this is not a close prospect. Who to recruit? When to billet? Baron, in the meantime, he looks at Arsene. Nothing is clear yet, Ellen continues. We can say that we are at the very beginning of the journey. Arsene glances back. Young people's eyes meet. But his majesty, Ellen declares, can give the order a name. The king is surprised that the honor of naming the Order of Magicians goes to him. Ellen says that the monarch did not miss here. He has long been hatching the idea of creating this organization and probably has a couple of successful names in mind. The king is surprised by the magician's insight. It does have a potential name. Valcanum, he says. Baron, meanwhile, draws a primitive smiley face from his dream on his knee. He seems very satisfied. The four people sitting at the table agree that this is a very good name, it seems to have been waiting for its chance. What do you say, Master Hertz? asks Baron of Arson. Holding a cup of tea in his hands, he stares at the young mage. He visibly stiffens. You like the name Valkenum, says the prince. Maybe you have something to do with him. Hearing these words, Ellen is already tense. He glances anxiously at Baron. But Arson simply, without any second thought, replies that he likes the name proposed by the king. A satisfied smile appears on the prince's face. Of course, it's true. Baron and Ellen are talking inside a sound-isolating sphere. Ellen didn't know that in Baron's previous life, he had a very specific relationship with Arsene. He asks the prince if it would be better to withdraw the invitation. He replies that this is not necessary. Arsene Hertz actually killed him in another timeline. But this does not determine what kind of person he is in this reality. In addition, the changes that occurred here could lead to the destruction of the future of the world from which Baron came here. Finally, the prince asks the magician not to worry. Baron will make Arson pay for what he has done, in one way or another. The prince laughs in the most sinister way. The mage cringes at this. Baron knocks on the door. A couple of minutes later, he is already drinking the tea served to him with a very satisfied look. The owner of the house tells him that it is a great honor for him to receive him here, and the prince replies that he is also pleased to see Baron Pollen. With a smile, he lets his host get up from his lap and sit down next to him. He then apologizes for coming uninvited, it's a hectic time right now and he hopes for the Baron's understanding. Pollen rises, bows, and declares that he and all his household are at the prince's complete disposal. He knows that Callion has always kept aloof from the intrigues of the royal court, and by visiting the Baron in secret, he may want to protect him from unnecessary attention. But why did he come? There are no secrets here, the prince openly declares that Pollen owes him his life, and he wants to know what his guild does. This is exactly what the Baron was afraid of, he can't seem to swallow the lump in his throat. Not so long ago, the guild got its hands on the diamond mines. She also began to supply horses and other goods to the royal stables. But Callion must be interested in something else. The Baron clenches his fists in exertion. We're not doing anything right now, your highness, Pollen says. The prince grins. He tells the Baron that he is the head of a merchant guild, which means that his managerial skills can be applied to several businesses at once. He agrees, but only if there is a sufficient amount of labor and money. Baron says that both are available. In addition, he continues, I would like to mention the Bryson house. Pollen looks at the prince in disbelief. You're not going to be a part of it, are you? He asks. The two men look at each other blankly. Baron realizes that he has misled the Baron and begins to laugh. He apologizes for not being very clear, of course, the prince will be involved in the case and in the most active way. 
The Baron sighs with relief. He repeats that with enough manpower and funding, he can create a very successful enterprise. And House Bryson will no doubt follow the course set by Prince Callion at the helm. Baron informs the Baron that a circle of wizards is being created in the kingdom. There are enough resources for its maintenance, but we need a smart manager who would manage the affairs of these unusual people in all respects. And I take it that we're going to remember the life you saved again. The Baron asks anxiously. Baron looks at him very calmly. That debt has already been paid in full, he says. Pollen doesn't believe his luck. He puts his hand to his chest and says that in this case he will gladly become a part of the common cause. Finally, I was able to change my fate. I lived to see my 15th birthday. I have gained the loyalty and favor of people I can trust. All that's left is, test the will of the Kisphanian at the Roselight Ceremony, and find out why I was sent back in time. Prince Callion, congratulations on your 15th birthday. Baron stands in the midst of a large crowd of those close to the court. Congratulations come from all directions. The prince glows with happiness. All the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Only Planchet is restless, standing alone in a corner, leaning against a pillar, looking blank. Baron passes by his brother and greets him with a happy smile. He gives me a scornful look, and he says it so that he can hear, red-eyed freak. The future prince turns slowly to Planchet. I will no longer turn a blind eye to your insults, he declares. My name is Callion. Oh, come on, Planchet replies, smiling nastily. You're no Callion. Baron looks at him blankly. You ride a horse and wield a sword. Planchet looks at his brother intently, as if trying to see into his soul. Who are you? He asks him. Cold sweat runs down Baron's face. 